So I know I'm late on this since Life is Strange 2 has been released in full for over a year, but with Don't Not continuing to make games in a similar style, I want to discuss what happened with this game and where Don't Not is taking the series as a whole in relation to the first game. To me, the second game was probably one of the biggest falls from grace I've ever seen in a game sequel. And while I don't think many would agree with my stance, at least not so strongly, I do think that a similar sentiment is shared by a fraction of the audience. Looking at the ratings, the original Life is Strange has a 96% positive review ratio on Steam. Just to put into perspective how good of a score that is, The Witcher 3 has a ratio of 98% and is almost universally considered a classic. Life is Strange achieved its ratio with a much lower budget and a more polarizing game by nature. After all, it's a pretty easy game to make fun of on the surface. Art students, hipsters, stereotypical jocks, teenager talk, broken time mechanics, they're all here. I've come to find out that there's more to it, and evidently so have many others. The game is actually one of the highest rated games in the story rich category, and while sales figures aren't officially known for Life is Strange 2, it's definitely known that the first game sold more. Life is Strange 2 has a positive review ratio of 84%, which isn't a terrible score, but the gap between the two is substantial. Despite a lot of fans expressing their preference for a sequel, the numbers don't lie. The general consensus is that the first game was more universally liked and garnered more interest. Anything from stream viewership to reviews and game awards, if you could even take those seriously, shows us. So what happened? What created that 12% gap of people who turned away? Why are people less interested in and less receptive to the sequel? Well, while I can't necessarily represent the group of dissenters fully, I can share some reasons that may perhaps resonate with some in that group and shed some light for those out of it. This is how Life is Strange lost its essence and ultimately divided its audience. I'm gonna start this off by diving into the first game, but before I do, I want to point out that I'm an unlikely fan of it. It's rather inconsistent with the rest of my tastes and interests in general. Here, let's play a quick game of which of these is not like the others. I like cars, guns, MMA, conservative political views, death metal, Halo, Halo death metal, and life is strange. Sorry for potentially spoiling the solution with my tone here, but how did that come about? Life is Strange is a game that I wanted to hate, seeking out anything I could to pick apart because how could I like it? My first exposure to the game was from watching Bro Team's Life is Dranks, so of course I was quite dismissive of Life is Strange like most people who watch that. Yet I gave it a shot, it pulled me in, and actually became my all-time favorite game. No, it's not the best game. Halo 3, The Witcher 3, and Dishonored are better games, but Life is Strange is the one I'd say I had the best experience with for as short as it was. How did this game appeal to someone like me, someone so far from any potential target audience they may have had in mind? A friend of mine who has mostly similar tastes worded it better than I could. The fact that we like it is a testament to just how good it is. So let's get into why it appealed to us. Life is Strange has a uniquely relatable setting. With so many games putting you in the shoes of career criminals, medieval knights, and space marines, it's surprisingly fresh to be put in a position of relative normalcy. Nobody has ever been in a position like Master Chief, but almost everyone has been a kid in high school. I myself was in my senior year at a small town high school in 2013-14. Perhaps this might make some players get nostalgic over their own high school experience, I didn't particularly like mine, so for me, I'm just glad that the setting is realistic. This feeling of familiarity extends to your character. Max is unexceptional, having neither a strongman physique nor a Stephen Hawking brain. She doesn't have any extraordinary abilities and is very much prone to making mistakes, just as most of us are. She also starts off as a bit of a blank slate, lacking in drive and purpose while not really having any strong convictions. Somebody needs to take that prick down. He'll take himself down. Yeah, history always proves that, right? Just wait for justice, you sheeple. The most she really has going for her is her desire to become a professional photographer, and she's not even very heavily invested in that. She does have a personality though, and while it's not at all like my own, it's good that her interests are cohesive and consistent with each other. Photography, indie music, low effort outfits, etc. Victoria refers to her as a waif hipster, and she fits the bill. She's not a confrontational person, and she doesn't want to be bothered herself. Sure, you can say that she's nosy, but only as nosy as you want her to be. 
Uh, Max, that's mine. Thank you. You're not helpful. You're just nosy. I think you better go. I guess as far as what's most relevant to her development is that she's soft and lacks confidence, the quintessential introvert. That's where the time manipulation factor comes in. How does someone like this handle suddenly becoming one of the most powerful people in the world? It's definitely not an entirely original idea, just look at Spider-Man. But whereas Spider-Man puts an unexceptional person into direct and public power trip scenarios, Life is Strange has its lead character keep their abilities more secretive and use them in problem-solving scenarios rather than brute force. Even Max's initial reaction to acquiring her ability fits with her character. She keeps it to herself and stays reserved, knowing that she'd be in a tough spot if she ever freaked out or revealed it to everyone around. This monumental change to Max's life is what kickstarts her character development, something I'll talk about later and something I can't talk about at all when it comes to another character, Chloe. Chloe is the other main character in the game, so let's explore what she's all about. Gee, thanks. I was hoping to hear something positive. About me? No, about me. Duh. I thought you'd at least be happy taking photos. Forget it. Chloe's a bitch. Okay, fine, let's give her a fair shake. Chloe can be best described as selfish, rebellious, and irritable. It doesn't really matter who you ask, whether they like the game or not, any player can immediately see these qualities in her. It's easy to dismiss her as a completely unlikable person, but what's more important is why she is the way she is and what her character represents in the bigger picture. Simply put, Chloe is damaged. It's even noticeable in her appearance, having many marks of a broken person. She's experienced several forms of loss throughout her life. A glimpse into her childhood in the middle of the game shows her as a straight-A student, highly motivated and interested in science. She then loses her father and her best friend simultaneously and quickly devolves into a rebellious teenager phase, which she witnessed the development of in Before the Storm. The lack of a father figure, the grief, and the financial issues all collectively broke her. Chloe isn't just a terrible person by nature, she's a statistic. Children coming from fatherless homes are more likely to become drug addicts or criminals, and may do things much worse than what you see Chloe do. Though the fatherless situation didn't last too long since David stepped into the picture. David, however, has a personality and temperament that heavily contrasts William's. David isn't as kind and playful as William was. Instead, he's strict, demands discipline, and generally values security over freedom. While these may not be inherently bad characteristics for a father to have, they aren't conducive to getting Chloe back in line. From her perspective, here's a stranger trying to insert himself as a father figure to her, while coming off as overbearing and nothing like the father she once knew. Who is he to tell her what to do? Her rejection of David as a father figure probably exacerbated the problem beyond what it may have been had she been left fatherless. To make the impact of loss even worse, she finds a new best friend in Rachel, who ends up going missing. That's Rachel Amber. Her missing person posters are all over Blackwell. Yeah, I put them up. She was my angel. After my dad died and you moved, I felt abandoned. Rachel saved my life. Now, when did Rachel actually disappear? Six months ago. She just left Arcadia. Without a word. Without me. She's left to believe that Rachel just fled the state without a word, which could have been even more hurtful than Max slowly cutting off communication with her. So while Chloe's character may not be relatable to most, it is at least understandable. You can say all you want how you could have dealt with these situations yourself, but the fact is that teenagers generally don't take these things well. Though while experiencing loss isn't someone's fault, it is someone's fault to not seek out ways to grow from it. Chloe makes little to no attempt to improve herself throughout the game, and so you could open up the criticism that she lacks development. Chloe, you can't keep blaming me and everybody for everything wrong in your life. It's so not fair. I gotta blame somebody, otherwise it's all my fault. Fuck that. Chloe, however, still shows remnants of her past self sometimes, so she's not wholly bad, and moreover, I don't think that her developing at all would make sense. Not only is she supposed to be dead, the ultimate form of stagnation, but I also think that it's not up to her, and I'll get into why later on. First, let's take a look at some of the other aspects of the world building and the idea behind the game. I'd like to talk briefly about the dialogue as a whole. A common criticism of the game is that the conversations between characters are unrealistic and cringeworthy. Amazeballs. 
I literally just got chills all over my neck. On the surface, it seems pretty fair, but being a high school student myself in the very year that the game takes place, I can say that the dialogue is actually pretty natural and representative of what teenagers talk like, barring some of the extremes. An actual conversation between teenagers and even some young adults today is usually even more vapid than what you'd encounter in this game. I also personally don't count the cringe against this game. You eat like a pig. Try the floor. I was eating those beans. Are you fucking insane? I was eating those beans! <laughs> it's actually pretty humorous and entertaining, though this is coming from someone who used to be an actual cringe binger in college. If the name Tyrone Leg Strong rings a bell, you're in the loop. But I know I'm not alone on this. The writers of Before the Storm seem to have picked up on the fact that people enjoyed this aspect of the dialogue because it's taken to a whole new level there. They even add a minigame that's all about creating uncomfortable conversations. Ah, so you're going to mouth off to me now, yes? And here I thought your well of witticisms had finally run dry. Oh, I get it. Because your name is Wells, right? You go around all day just hoping for an opportunity to make wall references? This must be a big moment for you. So the setting and the characters come together to build a fairly convincing world. Nothing about it is too over the top from the get-go and everything seems to be well-grounded, normal, and familiar. But of course, what you actually do in the world is anything but those things. There's a reason why I spent so much time talking about how Life is Strange establishes a sense of normalcy. It's a sharp contrast to the actual events that unfold. As the game goes on, you slowly take on the role of a sort of vigilante detective. Not only are you trying to uncover what's going on with the paranormal events you're experiencing, you're also uncovering the mystery behind Kate's drugging, Rachel's disappearance, and Nathan's erratic behavior. You also come to find out how all of them are related, and all of it is done in secret. Only Max and Chloe know all the details of the investigation. Others are left in the dark or given minimal information as may be prudent to arriving to the solution. One of my favorite game stories is L.A. Noir, so I'm definitely a sucker for a mystery in a game. Solely piecing together what's going on out of your sight and making predictions about where it all leads has always been compelling to me. But instead of the game focusing entirely on the problem at hand at all times, like L.A. Noir, it jumps between this and normal, everyday life. Not many games do this, the only other one that I could think of off the top of my head is Beyond Two Souls, and I don't think its split between the two was as even as in Life is Strange. In the daytime, you're attending school and interacting with people as usual, and at night, you're breaking into the very same school to uncover student records and add more puzzle pieces to the thoughts that you had brewing earlier on. I think I honestly love the idea of this particular scene more than how it actually played out. It's all because the scenario and the investigation as a whole feel plausible. Putting the paranormal aspects aside, it really feels like the mystery you're uncovering is something that, although is extremely unlikely, could actually happen. That combination of a plausible scenario and a world and characters with relatable and familiar qualities is what gives the game a unique feel. It's high school all over again except several wrenches have been thrown to the works that push you to leading a double life, balancing what you already know with completely novel, scary, and yet exciting experiences. Imagine if you were just living your everyday life, in school or not, and suddenly one of your friends disappeared. You have a lead, but you also have reasons not to tell the police about it. What would your experience be like in trying to find out what happened and chasing the trail? It might be frightening and traumatic, but also exciting in a way. I don't exactly sound like a very good friend in saying that, but you know what I mean. It's a stressful, yet interesting sort of break from the norm, without necessarily changing everything. That's one thing that Life is Strange seems to be about, breaking from the norm while trying to maintain some of the more familiar aspects of life, strangeness added to life. It's certainly carried on to the later games. As you go through this adventure, you'll encounter several situations that deal with the game's minor themes. I don't mean minor as in lesser, I mean that they're themes that aren't overarching or carry throughout the game. Their importance is great, as I think that these are the themes that the majority of the players resonated with. I won't go into much detail on each, but these include things like bullying, ego, insecurity, security versus privacy, and mental illness. 
They all have importance individually, but the bottom line is that they're realistic. Kate's suicide attempt isn't much different from stories like that of Amanda Todd. The value that we place on our security as opposed to our privacy and freedom has been a balancing act for decades, especially with the internet around. Victoria is a straight-up projector of her insecurities. Here comes the mysterious Max, disguised as a pixie hipster. Like all the other precious twee artists here. The issues that the characters around you in Life is Strange face are representative of a real world, and that's a big reason as to why it was a hit for so many people. Though, Life is Strange has a couple of other themes that carry on throughout the game, and I think that's where the paranormal aspects start to add up and let the game shine. Life is Strange is a coming-of-age story. That much is obvious. Several characters are progressing into adulthood, but the focus is on Max, who's returning to her childhood hometown as an adult, attempting to find some direction in her life through her passion for photography. At least that's what initially appears to be on the surface, but as the story moves forward, this theme turns into the first major theme of the game. Corruption. It's about the darker side of coming of age. Becoming an adult is multifaceted and includes things like development of critical thought and learning accountability. One important aspect of adulthood explored here, through the time manipulation, is how to deal with being in a position of power and making decisions. That's where accountability becomes important. However, this game focuses most on the worst part of it all. It's the part where your innocent young mind becomes exposed to the harsh realities you were previously unaware of. Corrupt politicians, terrorism, modern slave labor, things you were happily oblivious to in the past. Of course, for many, corruption also comes in the form of personal experiences. And for Max, these experiences come at her full force. She witnessed several instances of Chloe dying, potentially thwarted Kate's suicide attempt, dug up Rachel's dead body, was drugged and dragged into the darkroom, saw the destruction brought upon the town by the storm that she was responsible for creating, and all of that culminated in a long nightmare sequence showcasing the most shocking scenes and dialogue at the peak of her corruption, as well as the consequences of all her actions and what her options are going forward. What Life is Strange does with these overarching themes is it manifests each in a character. Kate goes through a good deal of it, but I think corruption is primarily represented by Jefferson. Jefferson wasn't exactly a very important character at the start, so in a way, it felt a little bit out of left field when he was revealed to be the primary antagonist. But that's exactly the point. The way Jefferson is exposed as the villain after appearing as an innocent minor character is parallel to how you witness corruption. It comes as a bit of a surprise after you've lived so long without knowing of it. He isn't just pointlessly evil. The game as a whole develops the theme much more gradually. It's not really possible to slowly reveal a secret villain, unless of course you count the hints they dropped early on in the game that you're unlikely to remember later on. In his class, Jefferson always spoke about exactly what he was doing in secret. I'm sure you read the syllabus like it was a Harry Potter book, so you must know today we're studying chiaroscuro. That beautiful word about the contrast between light and dark. The shadow play that gives photography such visual power. It's basic yin and yang. Black and white images are effective precisely because of their contrast. Although we don't technically see in my Yo! Some crazy shit is going down at the girl's door! But why would you pay attention to boring art class filler dialogue? It's because you're oblivious to the corruption behind it, which is then revealed to you in the investigation before you finally realize that it was all perpetuated by the same man who previously was making those veiled remarks which you were unable to see through. Now the second overarching theme in the game is a little more open to interpretation. This is where I'm going to reference White Light's video. I think his interpretation of this theme is pretty close to mine, and I was glad to see someone talk about it as it's not really something I see discussed often. The way he refers to the theme is the inevitability of consequence. Throughout the game, you make various choices that result in different future interactions with characters, environmental changes, etc. You make a choice and you're locked into a certain future, unless you decided to rewind and lock in a different one. It's a nice mechanic for us save scum, but either way, seeing the consequence of what you finally decide is inevitable, as is the consequential storm that comes with saving Chloe at the start. This ultimate consequence rears its ugly head several times via visions, weather patterns, and wildlife. However, when you encounter the storm at the end, it does render the consequences of your choices meaningless, regardless of what you ultimately decide. If you reverse the timeline and let Chloe die, you've erased all the events you and Chloe were involved in and anything you've built with her, and everything else plays out as it would have anyway. 
Otherwise, you destroy that for every other character, a physical destruction rather than a temporal reversal. It's a bit of an interesting utilitarian choice, but the choices and consequences throughout the game are squashed by it. It doesn't exactly fit, so let's try something else. Let's switch the inevitability of consequence to the inevitability of fate. Redundant, I know. While the game presents you with various choices and consequences throughout, take a look at what's happening in the background. As I mentioned, the game manifests its main themes and characters. This one manifests itself in Chloe. All while you're making choices to guide your adventure, Chloe is dying repeatedly and the storm continues to loom. Despite any choice you make, the story goes in the same general direction, and while that's true of any linear game, the ending essentially wipes away any of the choices that you made. Let's take a look at the outcomes more closely. The Bay ending appears to be the one that the game pushes for. Chloe herself suggests that she doesn't deserve to be saved over everyone else, and the ending scene itself evidently had a lot more production effort put into it. You prove that over and over again, even though I don't deserve it. I'm so selfish, not like my mom. Look what she had to give up and live through, and she did. She deserves so much more than to be killed by a storm in a fucking diner. Even my my stepfather deserves her alive. There's so many more people in Arcadia Bay who should live. Way more than me. This ending also feels more impactful to me, and I'll get into why later. Your choices are essentially all reversed when you take this path. Chloe was destined to die, and the world around you was showing you this the whole time. You reversing her death and keeping her alive, along with all the events that follow, is what's causing the chaos. This is the universe fighting back against you cheating fate. After the reversal, Chloe dies, Max never reaches out to find out about her rewind, and the vigilante investigation never happens, and Nathan busts himself by shooting Chloe so the investigation of Nathan and Jefferson is undertaken by the police. Max didn't just undo all the events, she didn't even use her knowledge of said events to reach the same result of Nathan and Jefferson in jail. The journey remained in her mind, but none of it translated to the world, where nothing functionally changed. The game actually established a microcosm for the greater story when Max went back and saved William from the car crash. Max tried to bring back William to give Chloe a better life, but ended up ruining her own life by changing her social status and ruining Chloe's family's life even further by plaguing them with medical costs that only delayed Chloe's death. My respiratory system is failing, and... Uh, and it's only getting worse. I've heard the doctors talking about it when they thought I was zonked out. So, I know I'm just putting off the inevitable. Chloe was destined to die in both timelines, and the environmental changes which stay consistent between the two timelines are proof of that. Chloe's ultimate death wasn't fixed, and by introducing even more changes, more chaos came about that even changed Max's life as she knew it. So why exactly were choices and consequences introduced only to be squandered by either ending? Wouldn't the fact that there are choices and consequences throughout being consistent with this theme? It could be that the choices and consequences system was created because it was necessary. Without it, you aren't getting much gameplay and you aren't differentiating the experience much from that of a movie. They're there for replayability and player involvement for sure, but is that really it? I don't think so. There are a couple of different messages that the game could be trying to send here. The first message it could be trying to send is one that may be pretty applicable to life, although typically to a smaller scale. Has this ever happened to you? You're working on a project of some sort. It could be a DIY project at home, a car mod, a computer program, anything. You see a clear opportunity in front of you to improve it, and so you invest some time and effort into going down that path. After some struggle, you end up breaking what you've already had going. You strip the screw, you got air in your hydraulics, you introduced an unexpected bug. Now you have to go back and undo the damage, and perhaps redo what you attempted initially, or just leave it alone. It's a bit like the rewind mechanic in the game. You're able to go back and see if you really still want to do what you set out to do after seeing the possibly damaging results. But at the end of the game, you rewind the whole thing. What's the game telling you when it has you do this? Leave it alone. Sometimes it's best to leave what you have alone and let it play out, rather than trying to make it better. Better is the enemy of good. You try to make things better, but everything got a whole lot worse as a result. Fate will run its course, and sometimes trying to fight it may only cause damage. Perhaps this is what the game was trying to get across, but I have another suggestion. 
The second message is one that I think fits a bit better. It's highly reasonable to say, and I'm probably overthinking this, that the writers didn't at all intend what I'm about to go into, but overthinking is fun, and everything seems to fit together so well that it's really difficult for me to think otherwise. I also apologize in advance if my thoughts here seem scattered, since it's a difficult philosophical concept that's been debated for ages. For any philosophy nerds out there, I'm talking about determinism, or perhaps the more fitting term, fatalism, which is the idea that all events in the universe are predetermined. Hard to believe, but I don't always make the best choices. Do you think it's like fake we're not supposed to be friends? That's how the idea started at least. It makes more sense if you frame it as all events in the universe are predictable as they are guided by a set of laws. Consequently, it's a nihilistic idea since it wipes away the possibility of free will because humans and everything that they are made up of are subject to the same laws as everything else. This is why I think Chloe's lack of character development is the point. She's the manifestation of fatalism and thus can't have the agency to change who she is. It's also an idea I subscribe to, so perhaps Perhaps I'm fitting it into Life is Strange because I want it to fit, though it makes more sense to me than the other ideas. Max initiates her adventure through breaking the laws of physics. Chloe is obviously linked to the butterfly effect, which is a part of chaos theory. In a system that operates under deterministic laws, a change from some external force can lead to significant changes later on, as the system's course has been altered. I'm not a real scientist, even though I play one at school, but... This seems like pure cause and effect. Maybe chaos theory. By reversing time, Max was able to enact her will beyond what's controlled by the deterministic laws because she was able to force the system to have a different outcome in that moment, using prior knowledge she wasn't meant to have while the rippling effects are out of her sight. How can the deterministic laws of the universe lead to an eclipse, dead animals, a storm, etc., just through Max saving Chloe? We don't know, and we can't know because that's just something that hasn't happened before to our knowledge. I guess we'll never know if it's magic or science. Even if it's from a wizard or a wormhole, you're part of something bigger. I don't believe in fate or destiny, but after this week, I realize I don't know shit. We've never had a real free agent act upon the universe. The world is as it is because it has always operated under the same conditions, and Max introduced the first change. This is how Max imposed true free will, as she reversed time and was able to change what the deterministic laws have so far dictated, including her own actions. That's how she was able to cheat fate. But that kickstarts a chaotic course of events in the world as she has disrupted the order and caused a reaction out of her sight. All decisions and events that stemmed from this event are reversed in the end and rendered meaningless. But what about the other ending? I'll get to that, but for now I'm working with this ending for reasons aforementioned. I think that your choices having no meaning in the end is the point. You never should have really had a choice in Chloe's fate to begin with, and now that's being taken away from you. Now this begs the question, isn't it rather counterintuitive to be presented with choices and branching consequences throughout only for the game to say in the end that you didn't really have a choice? Yes, it's counterintuitive just as fatalism seems when set against free will. In order to fully convey fatalism, it must be presented against the more intuitive idea of free will, or at least the illusion of it. Come to find out, the choices you've made weren't all necessarily of free will, if you didn't rewind. This is also why Life is Strange couldn't have been a movie, because the element of choice has to be there. Whether or not you believe in free will, I'm sure you can concede to the fact that our agency appears to make sense at a surface level. I can choose what clothes to wear, what to eat for breakfast, and then decide I don't actually want to wear this shirt so I'll get another one. Isn't that indicative enough of our agency? I'll give a brief rundown on a justification for fatalism, as the subject is extensive enough for its own video. At the lowest level, atomic or even subatomic, we've observed that the universe works according to a set of laws that are predictable. We know that these laws are predictable because scientists discover them and engineers can make inventions that take control of them. We have subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, etc. interacting with each other in the goings of physics and chemistry. The same principles guide beings at higher levels of complexity. A bacteria is a mass of various molecules that interacts with other things it encounters in a way that fulfills the functions of a living organism. Climbing up the chain, we can get all the way up to humans. Why wouldn't the same principles guide us? We are a mass of various molecules that interact with others, just as anything else. 
Our decision-making process consists of us taking in sensory input, light, sound, etc., and then interpreting it while factoring in prior knowledge, which is a result of a certain arrangement of molecules in our brains that is formed throughout our lives. We aren't special, and there is no need to introduce a concept of free will or a soul in order to explain our behavior. The reason we feel free is because of the complexity of our beings. If you ever observe the behavior of a less complex organism, like a spider for example, you you can learn their behavior rather quickly, what causes them to move in a certain direction, when they might decide to attack something, etc. Humans just have many more moves that they can make, and more degrees of freedom. That's what gives us the ability to make nuanced decisions in our lives and go through a more complex thought process. Just because you don't have free will, the ability to nudge the deterministic system to take a different course, doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't able to make decisions. You have a decision-making process. It's just guiding by deterministic laws that you may not be aware of nor take into account since they're often irrelevant. The game often mentions chaos theory, how patterns come about from seemingly random interactions between atoms, which are actually governed by deterministic laws. Wake up, Max. You saved my life twice now. You altered the course of my destiny, yours, and whoever. Do you know about chaos theory? What do you know about chaos theory, Miss I Hate Math? Five years ago, asswipe. Some people change. And your situation is the perfect storm for quantum physics. Why me? I'm just a geek girl in some small town. A perfect example of strange attractors? Don't they teach you kids anything at Blackwell? Those patterns, that organization, is how those reactions ultimately build up to something as complex and seemingly controlled as a human, which means we're no exception. Ultimately, the thought process that we go through isn't anything more than how the particles move and how the chemicals react, as they would have regardless. You don't have a choice because there is no you beyond physical matter to make that choice. It might seem like semantics, unless you're a spiritual person, but it may be a bit unnerving to think about just being another cog in the machine that is the universe. Though I think it fits with what Life is Strange is all about. You literally broke the laws that guide the universe to make a true decision in how fate plays out, and the universe retaliated chaotically due to you disrupting the system. Had you not had that supernatural power, you would not have had a choice to change fate, nor would you have made any of the choices in the adventure that followed. In the end, you find out that you don't even have a choice with the power due to the destruction you've caused and now have to undo, or let be and still have everything you've built destroyed. Everything you've built is invalidated because it's all founded on you disrupting the normal operations of the system. Everything played out as it was supposed to originally, with Max making all the same choices, not of free will, that she already would have leading up to the ending scene if she didn't discover her power. The game even supports this by making the distinction, when performing photo leaps, between the stand-in Max between your leaps, who is unaware of the choices made, and the free agent Max who makes those choices. So listen, in a few minutes, I won't know any of this happened. Nothing. We absolutely have to stay in your room and do nothing. Then we explain everything to David, and we finally let him do his job. You'll have to tell me exactly what I did and said just now. Just explain that I traveled through time using the photo. With no time reversal choices left in the mix, Stand and Max does it all up to the end. At that point, Free Agent Max takes over again, but doesn't use her power to will anything anymore because she has now learned the lesson of fatalism and continues to live her life as is, as it would have been. The system runs as usual, without disturbance. Stand-in Max is who is representative of us, unable to make any changes to the system in which we operate. The game is more or less an exploration of what true free will could look like, as opposed to what we have. Let me illustrate what Max did with Conway's Game of Life. To the uninitiated, it's a game in which cells live, replicate, and die according to a set of rules, and thus, patterns can be established, such as gliders or stationary objects. Here's a system, running on deterministic laws, which has established a stable pattern. If I add just one new cell to this system, that is, introduce an external force to offset its course, the entire system breaks down. The change is initially small, slowly eating away at a few of the cells, and doesn't affect most of the cells at all. But over time, the affected area grows and eventually engulfs everything. For every action, there's, there's a reaction. Whenever you reverse or, or alter time, maybe you cause a chain reaction. 
even in the environment. The whole system is violently torn apart. This is Max using her will to nudge the system off of its established pattern, and the gradual destruction of the system as a result, starting initially with damage to Max's brain which is shown through her nosebleeds. It's nearly impossible for Max to make a change that results in a new stable system that mostly resembles what was there before, due to the sheer complexity of the laws at play in reality and her lack of understanding of them. After the destruction, the dust settles and a new stable system is established eventually, but it barely resembles what there once was, much like the ruins of the town. There is no more chaos, but what you're left with is just waste. Max's change to the system wasn't very far-reaching, as it only affected Arcadia Bay and didn't quite get to anything beyond. And since Arcadia Bay isn't a closed system, it has many other complex entities working around it that can let it be rebuilt, disaster relief, new construction projects, etc. In the same way, other systems in a game of life can send out cells to interact with this destroyed system to change its form, but all of that would be guided by deterministic laws under which the other entities have always operated operated since their formation, rather than a free agent, which in this case would be a player placing cells. A quick note on a possible elephant in the room, what about quantum mechanics? Parts of that field of study have been observed to be random, so doesn't that throw a wrench into the philosophy? Not quite, for a few reasons. 1. It's highly unlikely that a quantum leap is happening in every choice you make in your brain. I'm not sure if that's ever been observed. 2. Quantum mechanics may actually also be guided by a predictable set of laws. We just may not be capable of observing what's going on behind the scenes. 3. Random events are just that. Random. I don't think that introducing a random factor creates freedom. Just unpredictability. So is it that we should just stop concerning ourselves with agency and choice, since fate will play it all out anyway? That's a dangerous mentality to have, to think that you don't have responsibility anyway so you could just let things go. Of course, if you start thinking this way upon adopting a fatalist mindset, it was meant to be. However, that's not the point of fatalism. It isn't meant to make you just give up. It's completely inconsequential to us, merely a philosophical view that attempts to explain how the world works, and it shouldn't bleed into your everyday life. It's metaphysics, not words to live by. This shouldn't be at the forefront of your decision making, merely a concept to keep in the back of your mind at most. To go further would be a demonstration of why the intelligence of humans can actually be detrimental to us from an evolutionary perspective. No other species can go through an existential crisis like we can, at least as far as we know. In a way, it's in our best interest to be blind to fatalism. We have to understand that, again from an evolutionary perspective, we have to continue to survive and thrive as a species, while competing against others, and work as a team to build society as generations have before us. That's our role as humans, and why we naturally feel empathy for one another to make morality more intuitive. What's to prevent us from thriving and enjoying our lives and our illusion of choice, even if we know it to be so? It's led us to good outcomes and will continue to do so. To do otherwise would be to just be a contrarian for no reason other than I can because it doesn't matter. You don't have to change after embracing fatalism if you choose to do so. Just be aware. Fatalism doesn't provide any incentive to change. Actually a disincentive in being self-destructive. And thus doing so once you're aware of it isn't logical nor optimal for your life. It will ruin your own experiences as well as the experiences of those around you, which is what you'd see in the game if you make bad choices with or without rewinding. Make the most of the situation you're presented with, regardless of what may be at play outside of your field of view. Your decision-making process is still there. This is where Life is Strange strikes a nice balance. You see the importance of good decision-making as it affects people and things around you. Many of the choices are ones that anyone could be presented with, without having a rewind power. You certainly don't always have to rewind if you're satisfied with your initial choice. Yet at the same time, it presents the harsh reality of fate as things are meant to run their course. And when altering the course of the system comes back to haunt you, you're forced to wipe away the whole chain of events you've caused, one way or another. That includes the choices that you made without free will, without rewinding, because none of them would have been presented to you anyway. Making choices responsibly is important for yourself and others to thrive, but ultimately, what was meant to happen will happen. Max, in the Bay ending, lives on as she would have anyway, just as we should after we learn of fatalism. 
The utility of belief in free will doesn't disprove determinism, but the reality of determinism doesn't take away the utility of good decision making. I mentioned before that each of the two major themes manifest themselves in a character. Max, however, is a manifestation of both, and they come together quite nicely. The squandering of her innocence and corruption of her mind progress throughout as she witnesses all the traumatic events that I mentioned before, and then end with the nightmare, a result of all the damaging things that she's seen, and also probably all the physical damage suffered via brain bleeds from rewinding, perhaps another symbol of her mind's corruption. Along with the corruption came a growth in conscientiousness. The corruption acquired in coming of age is paired with a sense of accountability and a duty to do what's right to counter it. At the beginning of the game, she's rather aloof and less aware of the world's evils. Sure, she does several things to help others, but still continues to live everyday life as usual. It's not always at the forefront of her thinking. Yet look at how that contrasts against the later parts of the game. She's focused entirely on the mission at hand, not once stopping to relax or enjoy a moment of downtime. The other characters take note of it too, particularly at the Vortex Club. Several characters comment on Max's intense look, and Max herself changes the way she speaks to people. She's less casual and more focused on altruism, even if she can only help through words at the moment. You seem so wise. Kind of invincible this week. I think that snow and eclipse gave you superpowers. Check to see if you can fly. You're obviously not cool with Trevor dating Dana. I tried to front like I was. When I saw them together, I came over to cry like a little bitch. No, it's, it's more like somebody who's in pain. I'm sorry, Justin, but you're a cool, considerate guy, and you're gonna find somebody just as cool, minus the drama. Look out for yourself, Taylor, and give my best to your mom. Oh, thanks, Max. She's doing great after her surgery. I'm glad to know you're looking out for us, too. Yet after instilling such an important sense of responsibility in decision making, the contrasting idea of fatalism comes up, first in the alternative timeline with a revived William, and then at the end when Max finally realizes her lack of control. This is a rapid development, with so many new things being thrown at Max. Exposure to evil, acquisition of great responsibility, and a fatalistic worldview to balance with that. What of the other ending then? With the existence of two, I obviously can't just take the one I focused on as canon. Doesn't this choice inherently reject the fatalistic theme, with Max and Chloe successfully cheating what was to be Chloe's fate? Before I get to that, these questions perfectly lead into my point as to why I'm even going over all this in the first place. Life is Strange has a lot to unpack, and it's all quite stimulating. There's a lot of room for discussion on some interesting topics, and there's some fun discourse to be had as far as how the game can be interpreted. How many games out there provide a foundation for this kind of philosophical thought? I've figured out for myself what I think the game is saying, and so have others with drastically different views. My aforementioned friend vehemently disagrees with my view on the second ending. His take is that by saving Chloe, despite the cost of doing so, you've essentially completed the objective originally set at the start. Throughout the game, you're always trying to keep Chloe alive. Choosing the Bay ending is just a sudden derailment and therefore failure of the objective. If the game made it a point for you to repeatedly save Chloe, thus instilling that response in you, then suddenly flipping on that issue at the end is inconsistent, and you failed to meet the commitment set at the start. I did so much to bring you back, Chloe. It worked. It actually worked. You're with me again. Looks like even fate doesn't want us apart. And I traveled through multiple realities just to save my ungrateful ass over and over. And this has some weight to it, and a substantial number of players must have seen it in this light. My counter to this would have to be to just stick to my position and expand on it to include this ending. The most concrete information we have to work off of in selecting the Bay ending is correct, beyond the obvious difference in effort put into each, is the fact that Chloe herself seems to think that her life isn't worth saving in comparison to everyone and everything else that would be lost. It's a utilitarian argument for the Bay ending. The main argument for me is how it ties into the fatalistic theme, which Max overtly states, in case you missed it. This is my storm! I caused this! I caused all of this! I changed fate and destiny so much that I actually did alter the course of everything! And all I really created was just death and destruction! 
When I said that Chloe doesn't have any character development, I suppose I wasn't being totally fair. She does indicate some development in the ending scene, like in finally referring to David as her stepfather. But notice that this development only happens when she's suggesting her sacrifice. This seems to me like a nudge in that direction, with Chloe finally acting sensible and selfless. And remember that alternate timeline? Max had to undo saving William because it had less destructive results. Shouldn't the same apply to Chloe's case? Notice that there aren't any major choices in the fifth chapter until the end, as Max frantically makes changes and learns how powerless she is in facing fate. Only the final decision is counted as a major choice. There are two main paths that the events after Life is Strange could take. There could be more storms, or other forms of a world's retaliation, or there could be nothing. The developers have confirmed the latter, but Max doesn't know that at the time of deciding, so let's look into both. If there is more to come after this storm, then have you not learned your lesson? The world has shown you repeatedly that it will create chaos if you defy the fate that it sets. What information do you have that shows that it will be over just after the storm? You have visions to go off of that all take place in the storm, and that would suggest that that is the final event, but you can't be certain because it's a paranormal phenomenon. You'll be making a huge mistake if you don't suppress the threat. If all retaliation stops, then I think the fatalistic message is still justified. You've just either missed it or went against it intentionally because it's not important to you. Yes, you've completed your goal of saving Chloe by disturbing the deterministic system, but at what cost? Many of your friends are probably dead, including the ones you may have helped escape death in the past. People's livelihoods are destroyed and the town is flattened. Was it worth it? Look at Max's expression as she and Chloe drive through the town. She's reassured by the fact that she still has Chloe by her side, but it's obvious that she's deeply troubled by all the destruction. This is not at all a positive outcome. To get to it, you had to break the laws that guide the universe, and you've created a great deal of chaos. That resulting chaos shows that the universe must, under normal conditions, run on fate, since that chaos is absent in the absence of a free agent. You tried hard to cheat the world, but the world cheated you and took back more. Sacrificing Chloe isn't a failure in the objective, it's success in learning your lesson. Why else would the game stress chaos theory so much? It's not just about Chloe's butterfly effect, it's about how the deterministic laws guide our choices, our inability to break from that, what doing so might look like, and the possible destructive effects of disturbing a system that is running on a foreign pattern. I won't trade you! You're not trading me! Maybe you've just been delaying my real destiny. Look at how many times I've almost died or actually died around you. Look at what's happened in Arcadia Bay ever since you first saved me. I know I've been selfish, but for once, I think I should accept my fate. Our fate. Though in saying all this, my point isn't to refute what my friend thinks. I've obviously set up a straw man from memory here, so it's not completely fair. My point is that there is an interesting discussion to be had on several topics, in searching for a cohesive message. Whether you agree with my take, my friends, white lights, or have your own unique one, there are many ideas to bounce around. There's a lot of information and a lot of nuance, and this is not true of Life is Strange 2, as I'll talk about later. So there's one imperfection to this whole idea of Life is Strange showing a glimpse of free will in a deterministic system. It could be argued that, even with the rewind, Max's actions are still deterministic. Think of the mechanics at play when a being that follows deterministic laws is granted the ability to rewind time. A deterministic event unfolds, and Max's decision to rewind is still deterministic because it originates from a stimulus to her brain, plus the state of knowledge of her ability to rewind. Max then rewinds time, and what that physically entails is unknown, but as a result, Max preserves her mental state from the now future, and then makes another deterministic decision based on that preserved state. At no point is determinism broken, and at no point does Max truly become a free agent that applies an external force to kickstart that chain reaction. It's all still within the bounds of the laws, assuming that the rewind is simply a new law that was introduced. So while I think that the point was to show a true free agent making a change in how things were meant to play out, and to show Max offsetting the course of fate, it can be argued that everything Max does with the rewind power is indeed still determined by fate, and she actually changed nothing. It's not what the writers were going for, as is clearly indicated by the dialogue, but thinking of it this way is consistent with everything aforementioned, so the idea is flawed. 
However, I don't think there's a better way. In order to introduce an airtight concept of free will, you'd probably have to adopt Cartesian dualism and treat the mind as a separate and truly free entity that isn't guided by the naturally occurring processes of the brain. With the mind separated from the material world, it can generate entirely independent thoughts now. But where would that leave the time rewind mechanic? It would be obsolete. If Cartesian dualism is presumed at the start, and thus the idea of an immaterial mind or soul is introduced, there would be no point to rewinding time in order to offset a deterministic system, because you could just do it directly at a whim. And there would be no function in the gameplay, as you'd just be going around and making choices, though now they'd be originating from a true free agent. Not only would that be boring, but it would be extremely awkward to implement. Would you just declare at the start that Max is the one true free agent, and then set her off to make decisions? It would amount to nothing but a weird footnote that makes no difference to the player, and presents the theme with no subtlety to make it mentally stimulating. So while the execution of Life is Strange's taste of free will idea doesn't totally add up, it's much more thought-provoking than the alternative. Maybe there's an even better way to present this concept, but I certainly can't think of one. I want to touch on a speculation among some players that there may have been more to the endings originally written before the game's release. Evidently, a lot of people were left disappointed with the endings as they were. Donod was on a somewhat tight episodic schedule, and some have speculated that they were just running low on their budget since this was a new endeavor for Square Enix. A good bit of this speculation was raised by the discovery of unused audio indicating that Nathan knew about the storm. The darkroom is situated in an underground shelter after all, so perhaps this could have been another plot point or branching path, and perhaps more was planned for how the story would end. However, given how well I think the endings fit into what I think the overarching themes are for the story, any changes to the ending sequence probably would have consisted of elaboration, detail, or maybe just a bit more content, as opposed to having more choices. There's also plenty of room for speculation as to what Max could have done differently for a more optimal outcome. For instance, why is it that when Max went back to the classroom at the start, she didn't just inform someone of the storm? She could have texted someone, perhaps Warren as that would be fitting, predictions of all the anomalous events that would happen. The snow, the eclipse, the dead whales and birds, the two moons, and then finally the storm. Warren could then see the early events unfold, and then spread the word to everyone that Max actually predicted them and that a storm is coming. Then, the next few events would confirm it, and then the town could evacuate. Why didn't Max just think of that or some other idea with a similar outcome where you can just save both? Some might view that as a plot hole, but I don't think that's the case. As I mentioned before, Max is a character of unexceptional ability, and that's what makes her relatable. Her inability to think of a better plan isn't something to hold against the story. You and I can probably come up with several plans like this from the comfort of our homes and with hours to kill. Max had to figure out what to do while being under an immeasurable amount of stress and with limited time, since the timeline jumps back to where she was before each time she jumps out of a photo. And she isn't capable of rewinding for any more than a couple minutes. If Max had come up with a master plan in the situation she was in, then the relatability and realism of her character would be lost. Here's another thought on an open question. How did Max acquire her power and what actually triggered the storm and the events leading up to it? To be honest, I actually don't care how Max's power came to be. I don't think it's necessary to explain, mostly because I can't think of any way in which it could be explained clearly with smooth delivery. How could something like that possibly be revealed, when the forces at play are paranormal and mysterious by nature? Do you just have God himself come down and explain it? One of my favorite games, Enderall, actually did that with the Black Guardian, a nearly omniscient being. It was the worst part of the story by far. Nothing is worse than filling in all the gaps by having some all-knowing being just tell you all the missing information. It's lazy, and I'd much rather just have it be left alone. As for the storm, that's a more interesting one. Is it actually just tied to Chloe, or Max's power, or both? Sure, Chloe's fate at the end is ultimately what determines whether the storm happens or not, but remember that saving Chloe is also the first act of changing fate that Max performs with her power. Had she not seen or reacted to Chloe getting shot, she would have never discovered her power and no change to fate would have happened. Nothing would have been set in motion from that point, so reversing that action does indeed reverse everything. So what if the storm is just tied to any act of reversing time and changing fate? What if an alternative, especially jumpy Max, never witnessed Chloe's death and instead, the first traumatic event that she reacted to was Alyssa getting a football to her squash? 
Maybe if she initially reversed that, that could have caused a storm too. That's not a very good initial motivator for doing anything in the story, nor a good dilemma at the end, but it would be entirely consistent with everything we know. I personally like it that they left this open as well. So even beyond themes and meanings, the game leaves you with plenty of things to think about. Alternative possibilities, unexplained origins, etc. I can't say that this is always a positive quality, some things just have to be clear in order to make a story work at all. But I don't think what Life is Strange leaves open causes many problems of that sort. That's with the exception of a time rewind mechanic itself. The teleportation, the retention of items you're holding, etc. really is fundamentally broken. It certainly didn't get everything right in this regard, but the working parts it left open are at least somewhat interesting. What's great about all the major themes and open questions to ponder in Life is Strange is that they aren't really things that affect our everyday lives that much. Sure, the minor themes definitely are about realistic topics, like suicide or bullying, but the way they go about presenting these isn't really divisive at all. With the major themes, even if there is any division, it's rather unimportant. The bottom line is that the issues that Life is Strange deals with are mostly philosophical and not political. Wait, what? But how could I be so blind to the blatant fact that this game is full of woke garbage? Or rather, woke enlightenment, if you're on that side. Actually, I think it's really not. Again, this is coming from a gun-toting, V8-revving Trump voter who gave the game a pretty biased and unfair shake. Let's go over what political themes the game has to offer. I've already mentioned a couple in the minor themes, suicide and security versus privacy. Suicide prevention, in reference to Kate's subplot, isn't really politically divisive. It's more like just a question of how much should we put into it in terms of resources, which is never brought up anyway. Assisted suicide, in reference to Chloe in the alternate timeline, is the more controversial issue. Should a terminally ill person be able to commit suicide if they choose to before they succumb to their illness? The game doesn't really take a side on it, and it leaves it completely open to the player. However, your action is reversed immediately afterward anyway. Balancing security and privacy is definitely divisive, but again the game never takes a side on this either. You have the option to sign Miss Grant's petition on it, or not. Max appears to be opposed to David's take on security, but then David ends up being a crucial character in the later chapters and showed, with his investigation, that the security aspect is important, as his information helped lead Max and Chloe to the dark room. No message is being sent here, it's merely a point of plot and world building, and the game fairly shows both sides. So what else was political? Well, back when the game was made, 2015, there was some debate over gay rights, especially since that's the year that same-sex marriage was legalized. Aren't Max and Chloe just token lesbians to make the game hip and with the times? Maybe, but who knows what motivations the developers had for making them so. But this clearly isn't something being shoved down your throat. It's entirely optional. You could side with Chloe the whole game and get into the romance state, which really doesn't amount to anything more than a kiss rather than a hug goodbye. And you could also shit on Chloe throughout and not do that. You have the same options for a romance with Warren, which also ultimately doesn't go anywhere other than a kiss that's ultimately reversed, just like the other one. Or again, you can just shit on him. Maybe the game is telling you not to be a simp like Warren? A red pill? Jokes aside, everything is up to you and nothing is forced. You could say, however, that the romance state can come up for a player unintentionally when the player just meant to be a good friend to Chloe in any way possible. Yeah, maybe you weren't going for it, but is it really that much of a surprise? These two just went through one of the wildest supernatural adventures of anyone's lives and are about to undo it all and lose each other. A deeper connection is par for a course, romantic or otherwise. Up next on the chopping block, guns. Oh boy, I should be tearing into Chloe right now and why everything she does and says is wrong, right? Well, what Chloe does and says doesn't necessarily have to match with the game's message, as I think it's actually showing Chloe in a negative light. Look at this idiot shooting herself with a ricochet. They're using her to push an anti-gun message? Even those who think Life is Strange is anti-gun can acknowledge this inconsistency, so let's consider for a moment that maybe it isn't. The first time we see Chloe with a gun, she immediately points it at Max, booger hook on the trigger, but unloaded. While she's correct in knowing that nothing can go wrong, assuming she checked it beforehand, this is just a display of immaturity. Treating every weapon as if it's loaded at all times builds a good habit. In case you thought it was unloaded, but it actually was loaded, it wouldn't matter because you'd be handling the gun safely anyway. Chloe clearly hasn't gotten to that point of maturity. She's reckless and lacks knowledge. Immediately after, she goes on to make the following statement. I thought you believed in gun control. Yes, I believe I should control the gun. 
It's the men who need to be checked. You trust Nathan or David? Clearly a sexist and incorrect statement, but you have to remember who it's coming from. Chloe is a rebellious, angsty teenager with a broken childhood, as I mentioned before. It's no surprise that she acquired such twisted views when she lives with David, a father figure she despises while her real father is dead, and has gone through traumatic experiences mainly involving men. James Amber plotting to kill Sarah, Damon Merrick stabbing Rachel and being involved in James's plot, Nathan Prescott drugging her, etc. Some of these things are from before the storm, which the player may not be aware of in Life is Strange, but they still further reinforce Chloe's already troublesome childhood and adolescence. Obviously, her personal experiences shouldn't amount to a generalization like this, but it's quite hard to avoid in practice. The point is that you can't take what Chloe says seriously, because it's obvious that her views are twisted, her opinions are nonsensical, and her ability to handle a firearm is poor. Could Life is Strange actually be pushing a message saying that you shouldn't be irresponsible with guns, and that opinions from people who don't understand guns shouldn't be taken seriously? Sounds reasonable to me. Maybe it's even a bit of a right-wing view, and oh boy, you already know I like those. It's not really a partisan thing though, it's just sensible. But wait, what about that scene in the scrapyard, and the infamous stupid gun line from Max? In this scene, Chloe yet again demonstrates her incompetence with a firearm. She handled the gun poorly and ended up getting hit with a ricochet, upon which Max utters, Fuck up, gun! and rewinds to help her. Now we could dismiss this as Max also not being knowledgeable about guns, and thus the same message is sent as before. Max clearly has little to no exposure to guns herself except in a negative light, so it's no surprise that she thinks they're bad, although her opinion was formed more out of fear than Chloe's. She often makes anti-gun remarks throughout the game, but I think that's mostly due to her lack of familiarity, not yet understanding that guns are merely a tool and not inherently dangerous without a dangerous user. Are you kidding? After yesterday, I'm kinda over guns, Chloe. <sighs> Freaks me out that you have one. Don't you trust me? Yes, but not that gun. People who don't know anything about guns will typically just form their opinions through what they hear about them, and that's usually in news stories about people getting hurt or killed. Not only that, but Max also further forms a negative opinion because she's often involved in bad situations with guns. The fact that all the situations involving guns are bad isn't necessarily painting an anti-gun picture. It's just the nature of guns. Any situation involving guns, outside of training or hunting, is going to be bad. Max appears to at least understand the utility of guns in a self-defense scenario when she tries to defend Chloe from Frank. Obviously, it's another bad situation, but it did prevent it from escalating. Max is also put off by the idea of shooting someone, something that any pro-gun person would also feel. It may be necessary to defend yourself, but it certainly doesn't feel good. Anyway, Max wasn't going to be the one to correct Chloe's horrible gun safety malpractices since she doesn't know much better herself, aside from an instinctual fear that arguably would keep her safer than Chloe overall. I'd also add that this line made me laugh, and thus I don't view it as a negative. More on that later. Actually though, I think Max was correct when saying this. Chloe is shooting a revolver with about a 4 inch barrel. My guess was that this is a 38 special. Looking at some 38 specials on Google Images, the Smith & Wesson Model 10 looks quite similar. Whoever wrote the Life is Strange wiki page seems to agree with my take, so I'm going to assume that this is the weapon in question. Frank also confirms this, commenting that it's not a magnum. Let's look at some ballistics data. 38 Special isn't a very powerful round. Both its muzzle velocity and energy are less than that of a 9mm, generally speaking. This can vary with barrel length and the type of ammunition used, but again, the weapon in question appears to have about a 4 inch barrel, which is pretty common for ballistics testing of 38 Special, so the figures on this chart from Wikipedia should be fairly close. The type of ammo, we can't be sure about, but considering her family's finances, I don't think it was anything highly performant like a plus P load. So it was probably a typical target or defensive load. Round nose, flat nose, soft point, FMJ, or hollow point. The typical safe distance for shooting steel with handguns is a minimum of 10 yards. Judging by the scene, it's hard to tell, but it seems like they're just about there, but that's the rating for steel targets specifically made to minimize ricochets, so the card doesn't meet that requirement. Though if you look at how the bullet travels, you can see two distinct paths before it ricochets straight back. If this was a hollow point, it would have likely fragmented very easily and wouldn't have been intact enough to come straight back like this, holding its form. 
an FMJ would probably bring us closer to this result, but even then, the round made a direct impact and still appeared to come back with the same speed as when it was fired, without any fragmentation. The energy loss from the shot should slow this round down to the point where it's questionable that it would be able to make much of an entry wound beyond just penetrating skin, but it came back with no signs of energy loss. This is especially shocking for a round as slow as 38 Special. Did Max think of any of this when coming to her conclusion of a gun being stupid? Of course not. But I'd actually have to agree here and say that a gun that fires projectiles that defy the laws of physics almost as badly as her rewind power is pretty stupid. Maybe it's just another paranormal aspect of this world. Now before I move on from the topic of guns, I want to go over Chloe's defense scenario with Frank. If you couldn't immediately tell by the structure, this is an addendum. I originally put in a clip with something along the lines of, Chloe's defense scenario proves that she has terrible judgment of when to use a firearm. Looking back now, it seems I misremembered. I probably could have gotten away with it too since I know a lot of people thought that Chloe was in the wrong here, but that would be disingenuous of me to do, so here we are. Chloe has two scenes in which she shoots Frank, so let's break down both, starting with the simpler one. Seriously Frank, don't get all spun out. We're only here to find Rachel. Rachel isn't in here, and I'll spin you on your ass. What the fuck are you dorks up to, huh? Trying to break into my business? This time, the price is wrong, skank! Calm down, Frank. Let's just Don't talk. Don't you ever tell me what to do. Get it, bitch! Get it! Step the fuck back now! Oh my god! Gosh! Yeah, you actually shot me! I wasn't gonna hurt you! Oh, this fucking hurts! Oh, it hurts! The first question to ask in this scene is, was Chloe justified in pulling out her gun? Before the situation even unfolded, Max explicitly told Chloe not to rely on her rewind power, since it's failed her in the past. This would make Chloe more careful, risk-averse, and protective in whatever would come about, so it's worth noting. In the actual encounter, Frank angrily grabs Max with half a dad choke, which would suggest that he's on edge and ready to attack at any moment. If you're Chloe, watching middleweight-sized Frank manhandle Max, who probably weighs like 100 pounds, what are you supposed to do? You're not going to take him on in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You need an advantage, that being the gun. The rewind power is also relevant here. There's no telling what Frank will do next, and Max won't be able to rewind if Frank decides to knock her block off. The situation is too dire to try to calm Frank down at this point, especially since Max just tried that. Chloe is justified in pulling out her gun. So what about the actual shot? This one is honestly a no-brainer. Frank, while having a gun pointed at him, quickly pulls out a knife and advances toward Max. For Chloe, there's no time to determine what Frank's intentions might be, whether he just wants to look intimidating or actually attack Max. The consequences of Chloe thinking that Frank isn't going to do anything serious and being wrong are too severe to take that risk. As for Frank, was he really expecting to not get shot when he quickly pulled out a knife while having a gun pointed at him? Definitely the worst possible time to try to look tough. But was he being sincere when he said he wasn't going to hurt them? Actually, probably. If Chloe doesn't have the gun when this scene plays out, Frank threatens Max with his knife but never actually attacks her. Chloe and Frank then fight over the knife before Frank gets stabbed in the leg, but still, Frank doesn't just attack when he draws his knife. Of course, there's no way Chloe could actually know what's going through his mind. Protecting her friend takes priority over figuring that out, especially considering that Frank already threatened to cut her in a less heated exchange. Now for the second scene. You've got a knife and God knows what else! Are you really afraid of Max here? I'm not afraid of anybody except my maker! And you little bitches think you can outsmart me? Why, because I'm trailer trash? You're Blackwell trash! And it's time to take you out! Calm down, Frank. Let's just talk. Don't you ever tell me what to do. Get it, bitch! Get it! Step the fuck back now! Pompadou! You fucking killed my dog! Oh my god! This one starts out the same way as the first, so Chloe is still justified in drawing her gun. Frank's dog then runs out of the RV and toward Chloe. So is Chloe justified in shooting the dog? In a previous interaction, Officer Barry said that he suspects Frank's dog was trained on blood, and that Frank used to be involved in dogfighting rings, which Chloe was probably aware of since she knew of Frank and Damon's activities. Frank also said that his dog would bite your head off to Max before things went sour. Thus, Chloe has reasons to suspect that if a dog runs at her, it's almost certainly to attack. That's not just speculation though, because actually, if Chloe doesn't have a gun and Frank's dog runs out, it bites Chloe's leg and Max is forced to rewind. 
Therefore, I think Chloe is justified in shooting the dog. Is Chloe also then justified to shoot Frank afterward? Upon seeing his dog get shot, Frank rages, pulls out his knife, and starts speed walking toward Chloe. Due to the camera angles, it's difficult to tell how far Chloe is from Frank when she shoots him, but it was likely within 20 feet. At the pace Frank was moving, it would take very little time for him to cover that much ground to get to Chloe, and even less if he sped up. Again, Chloe can't rely on Max's rewind and doesn't have time to determine what Frank's intentions are. Her alternatives are to face Frank without a gun, which would be a complete brainlet move, or to run away, in which case it's questionable that she'd be able to outrun Frank, and it would take her out of a decent shooting position should she decide to fire later. Also, Frank drew his knife and advanced toward Chloe while she already had a gun out. Same stupid move as before, he was practically asking to get shot. Okay, so now the question is, does this contradict the previous notion that Chloe doesn't understand guns? It's possible, but Chloe's poor handling of a weapon is still maintained in this scene. Poor grip when aiming, poor trigger discipline, and shooting one-handed are all mistakes that she makes here. I'm not sure if she's even using the sights. All of these mistakes are of the same nature as the others previously presented. Firearms handling and judgment are separate issues. It's entirely possible to be good at one and horrible at the other. You could shoot as well as Lucas Botkin, but use your weapon at totally inappropriate times, or you could be like Chloe, having an understanding of when self-defense is justified, but being highly prone to accidents, like ricochets or negligent discharges. My interpretation of these scenes is that they show how guns can be useful in a self-defense scenario, especially when you'd otherwise be at a significant disadvantage. Wait, wasn't this game supposed to be anti-gun? Anyway, maybe there's something I'm missing here, and please point it out if that's the case, but I think the conclusion I came to is reasonable, and the fact that I did come to that conclusion means that, at minimum, the gun-related scenes are open to interpretation, as opposed to having a clear-cut anti-gun message. These last few are ones that can be found through little pieces of dialogue or props in the world, and they're quite minimal. It may look like I'm grasping at straws here, but I'm really trying to find every political message there is in the game to be fair. Abortion. Dana got one, and there's really not much else to it beyond that. It seems to be just an acknowledgement of teen pregnancy and abortion being a problem in this world, as it is in the real world. Does the game take a side? On one hand, Logan was shown to be rather unfit for fatherhood. On the other hand, Dana was clearly under distress over the situation, maybe feeling some regret. So no, no side is taken. Feminism. This comes up once when Max can look at a poster that boils down to, women can swim too. Uh, yeah, no argument to be found here. It really just looks like a piece of old Blackwell history back when that discussion was actually a thing, but it's not relevant now and you'd be hard pressed to find people who disagree with this and live in a western civilization. Climate change. A political topic for sure, but it only comes up when various characters discuss the odd weather and dying animals. Even for a climate change denier, it would be pretty reasonable to ponder for a moment that maybe it's true when seeing the bizarre weather going on in Arcadia Bay. Drugs. Frank is a drug dealer who supplied Nathan with GHB that was used by him and Jefferson to commit date rape. Students buy drugs for various purposes too. Hayden buys dank OG, OG bud, bud for parties, and Stella buys Adderall to help her study, both of which are real ways teenagers use drugs. There's no real discussion here. We know drugs are bad. Weed might have been somewhat relevant at the time since the game takes place around the time that Oregon legalized, but again, no side is taken. Max doesn't partake in Chloe and Hayden's offers. Finally, veganism. The animal rights side of it, rather than the diet, is a political issue. There are posters all over the Blackwell campus advocating for it, which seems part of a course in a private art school. It's no shock that an art school would have vegans, anti-gun people, etc. Max brings it up when getting breakfast, saying that she should become a vegan, but she can't resist the taste of bacon. Again, no real contention here, I'm sure plenty of meat eaters have similar thoughts. If a cost-effective, highly available alternative to meat is ever created that both mimics the taste of meat and has the same nutritional value, I would switch too. It's not a divisive statement at all as it doesn't really take a side. Max also often brings up her love of animals and makes negative remarks about things like David's hunting hobby. Many characters briefly bring up their views like that. Max likes animals, Chloe is pro-gun control, etc. But these seem to just be minor additions to characterization. None of these things are major points projected onto the world. You'll still encounter characters from all walks of life just voicing their opinions as people do in reality when it's relevant. 
and different sides are given a fair shake without the game overtly taking a side by actually having the world show a consistent or recurring narrative, or showing characters with a certain set of views as wholly bad. It just leaves information out on the table for the player to think about. Is David's surveillance too much of a violation of privacy? Or does his position have some merit since the information he gathered was paramount to the investigation? Should animal rights be taken as a priority over feeding the population with meat? Or is it too costly and difficult to switch as so many people's livelihoods depend on it? Like the fishermen at the two whales. Would stricter gun control keep us safer? Or should we focus on the problem of people who misuse and don't understand guns? You're free to draw your own conclusions. Max herself even seems to eventually warm up to David. They never see eye to eye, and that's fine, but Max understands that David, the gun-toting, conservative, strict parent, isn't the way he is out of malice. He has good intentions, just different ways of going about things that initially seem alien to someone like Max. You tried. It's obvious you care. Even if your methods are... Fucked up. I know. I'm glad I stood up for you. I try not to... Use my service as an excuse, but it's hard to come home after war. David shows a similar change of attitude towards Max, indicating that he was impressed with how she and Chloe conducted their investigation. But I have to admit, I'm impressed by you, and Chloe, and your investigation. I had all the high-tech toys, well, you had each other. The beginning of the game had us believe that David was just an overbearing hard-ass, and maybe even a threat, but as events unfolded, we got to understand that his goals were the same as Max and Chloe's, to investigate the nefarious acts around Blackwell, and to put an end to them. He was misunderstood, judged too hastily, and was on your side all along. Your only disagreement was on the methodology used to achieve those goals. A similar finding of common ground happens with Frank as well. In general, characters set aside their differences in beliefs and principles upon learning that they have similar intentions. This is indicative of a healthy society that works toward a shared purpose, despite some back and forth on how to get there. It's the exact opposite of political division. There's no political message being sent, just some ideas being thrown around mimicking the political buzz of the real world. Characters talk about it just as we do, and regardless, it's difficult to leave politics entirely out of a world that's clearly meant to represent our own. And that's it. That's all the political or even vaguely political content in the game that I've noticed. So much for being woke. The most unique thing about Life is Strange, to me, is how I felt about it. It feels like no other game and that it has so much variety to it. I'm practically an emotionless husk of a human being, so this was a surprise to me. The game somehow put me in a mindset where I could enjoy everything it threw at me. I could take it seriously, but also take its blunders lightly. There definitely are some deliberate jokes, but Life is Strange also has a lot of seemingly unintended humor. You could tell when the writers didn't mean for a funny scene to be funny, but everything just came together such that it was. I'm not one to easily laugh either, but there's something about the writing here that makes it enjoyable even when it's bad. I can't count a scene against the game when it got a positive response out of me, even if it wasn't intended. No way! No fucking you okay, way! okay, Victoria? Oh, Sammy, oh, sorry. Wet, wet paint is not good for hair, nope. Sorry. Get the hell away from me, weirdo! Hold on, hold on, we'll get some towels, we'll be right back. So move your ass before I drive. Yup, I still have goddamn paint all over my face. Good thing my faithful minions took their sweet time bringing me a towel. Check out Mad Max. <laughs> Ready to fucking thrash. I'm so hardcore. I have to take a dump. Are you coming, Max? All you have to do is crank up the IV to 11. These moments were a hard contrast to the compelling parts of the game that I could actually take seriously and it resulted in a mixture of emotions unlike anything else. Laughter, discomfort, cringe, sadness, calmness, they're all here and in a big way, mixed in with contemplation of the themes and the time travel situations, with eureka moments and making sense of something previously confusing. I enjoyed every bit of it, and regardless of where it took me, it did so effectively. It made me burst out laughing, and at the same time, while I've never cried because of a game or movie, I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel anything for Life is Strange. I think the best way I could put it is that it let out a bit of my shadow, which explains why I liked it despite being so different from my other tastes. 
I'll illustrate what I'm talking about with my favorite sequence. Max is in the darkroom, about to be murdered. It's a tense moment, but David comes in and ends up clobbering Jefferson in a fight with Max's help. A moment of relief as you're unbound and victorious. Talking with David, you can choose to tell him about Chloe's death. At this point, David is already established as my favorite character, and this is a moment of true hurt for him. He finds out that he failed as a father figure in protecting his family, and takes out his frustration on Jefferson. I felt sympathy for him in the moment, but then it was time to go and stop the storm. Max comes out of a shelter realizing that the storm is already raging, and that she has to quickly get to the town to get a photo from Warren to stop it. Again, the intensity is raised, and Max then drives to the town. While driving, she turns on the radio to get some news on the state of the town. The host of the station is ranting and raving about how God is punishing everyone for their sins, and getting angry about being trapped in the station. Genuinely funny. But then, Max checks her voicemail and hears that Nathan tried to warn her about Jefferson while her ringer was off. He was a red herring in the investigation, manipulated by Jefferson the entire time to enact his plot. His psychological problems were taken advantage of and he was left broken, and now dead. Now the game is tugging at my heartstrings, only for Max to then arrive at the town, walk in, and watch Emin get smoked in the head by a flying piece of sheet metal while he's looking for the perfect photo opportunity for his portfolio in the middle of a hurricane. At this point, I don't even know what I'm supposed to feel. Everything at once? All the changes were so quick and effective that I'm just left bewildered and not at all in a bad way. Before the Storm seemed to have a similar vision too, since there are plenty of moments in that game that played out in the same way. Despite being mixed throughout, the mood had a general shift as the story went on. Early on in the first episode, there were lots of cringy and funny moments that almost confirmed my initial bias against the game, but again, they ended up being pretty entertaining overall. As the game went on, things got more serious, not quite dropping the humor entirely, but more serious nonetheless, culminating in an ending that I think is a cool concept and also rather impactful. While Max erased all the events in the timeline, she didn't erase her memory of it. None of it was a dream, all of it was real, all of it actually happened, but only she knows of it. Max went through the wildest adventure of just about anyone's life with her best friend that she reunited with, and now carries that experience with her. Chloe knew nothing of it, and didn't even know that Max came back at all. She's just dead in the bathroom. At the start, interactions with Chloe led me to believe that she's the worst character by far. By the end of the game, I actually had some sympathy after I learned about her past and ultimate fate. It's quite the turnaround. Chloe never got better on the surface as she didn't change as a person at all. She couldn't. Rather, what grew was my understanding of why she was the way she was and that her story is a tragic one. So, those are the reasons why I hold Life is Strange in such a high regard. I hope I covered some points that resonated with other fans or maybe brought up a new idea or two. But let's take a look at Life is Strange 2 now, where I'll mainly be contrasting its many blunders with the first game. First of all, I'll go over the similarities with the first game and the improvements made, though there really aren't many. I like that they retained the art style. The sort of picturesque painted look of it with vibrant colors was a good, budget-friendly approach. I'm generally receptive of games that go for a unique style over realism. Life is Strange lacked in the quality aspect though. The second game had some significant improvements in terms of overall visual detail, as well as animation quality, which was seriously lacking in the first. I think some of that had to do with Before the Storm raising the bar on animation quality, so I commend Deck 9 for that. Music overall had a similar style, but felt like a downgrade. Perhaps it's just because I obviously liked the first game more, the music there was just more memorable to me. Sifting through the soundtrack of the second, it's difficult to find anything good that isn't just a moody ambient track, though I'd say it's similar enough. The developers seem to have similar intentions in what emotions they want to instill in the players with the music. The controls were better, there's no doubt about that. The mouse controls of the first game weren't horrible, but definitely suboptimal. The story also starts rather similarly, where you're a teenager going through everyday life and encounter an unexplained supernatural event, which then carries on to be a power that's used throughout to make things happen. 
Both games have their fair share of bugs and QA issues. I'd say overall the second game is more bug prone, but only marginally. And well, that's just about it. It's really not a lot, and what the game did similarly or better is minor and mostly unimportant. These are elements to set up a Life is Strange game, not make it. You can't just win the players over with calm scenes of the camera panning around the world as a main character narrates their thoughts to ambient music. There has to be much more, and that's where the failures begin. The plot of the second game starts off with a similar but different premise. Sean and Daniel are going through their normal everyday lives when a paranormal event throws a wrench into the works and the two have to run away from everything they knew. It establishes some level of normalcy momentarily at the start, but it's not nearly as effective as in the first game since that normalcy isn't at all maintained throughout. I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, it's just something that I enjoyed greatly in the first game that's now drastically different. I think the new approach can be done tastefully, but the first game pulled off its sense of normalcy well and it's a little disappointing to see it go because it's not typical. Life is Strange had you advancing the plot in the shadows, working in secret, unbeknownst to the people around you. You kept your situation hidden from everyone else and continued to live your everyday life around it, with many moments being disconnected from it completely. The moments spent sneaking through Blackwell in the dark were some of the most memorable to me out of any game. It's a break from normal life, doing something you aren't supposed to, and I actually never would've, but probably could've. Kinda makes me want to go explore abandoned buildings or something. It's a little, plausible adventure. Not anything over the top or monumental aside from the paranormal aspects, which aren't at all in focus in the moments I'm talking about. Much of Life is Strange would work without the paranormal. It just would leave the philosophical themes without much weight. Life is Strange 2 is just another story all about how my life got flipped turned upside down. Sure, Sean and Daniel also tried to keep a low profile and were secretive around the people they encountered, but their issue was completely known to the public, and their lives changed completely. They didn't have a home, they didn't keep going to school, they didn't see their same friends, everything changed. That realistic, normal setting was something refreshing in Life is Strange and Before the Storm. But with the normalcy gone, is the world they roam through still realistic? Nope. And I'll get to that later when discussing the themes. The setting itself may be realistic, but the way people interact is absolutely not. Despite it being different, a concept like this absolutely has potential because it does have some appeal behind it. Leaving behind your normal life without any sense of direction is an interesting idea. You don't have any idea of what you'll encounter, and that element of surprise may lead to an interesting adventure. Before the Storm hinted at this idea briefly toward the end of episode 2, in a scene where Rachel proposes that she and Chloe should pack their bags, get in a truck, and leave behind their lives as they knew them. Chloe's life was already in a bad state, and Rachel's family had lost meaning to her because of how she now saw her father. I like this scene a lot. Not for the reason you're immediately thinking of, until I remember that I was toward the end of the second episode in a three episode game, making the execution rather poor. Either they'd try it and fail very quickly, or something would happen to change their plans very soon. But it did spark an interest in the idea for me. I'm certain that this has some appeal to many other people too. A new experience, possibly an uncomfortable one, that greatly shakes up the norm. It's actually something you can see succeeding on YouTube. Shy, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, has several popular videos of adventures that are rather abnormal, involve a high risk, and may be unpredictable. Things like hopping on cargo trains to try to reach the Baltic Sea, or going through the Chernobyl exclusion zone while staying hidden from military patrols. GeoWizard went on adventures to cross Wales and Norway in a straight line or at least as straight as possible. Again, a highly unpredictable journey with an added twist that you can't avoid the obstacles that you encounter. You don't really know what you'll run into next except at a high level from what you may see from satellite imagery when laying out your path. I suppose this is what Don't Not was going for in the second game. Heightened unpredictability. Not only do you have more potential for unpredictable situations and encounters, but your setting is always changing too. You knew you'd be staying in Arcadia Bay and Life is Strange because your issues were localized to it. You don't know where you'll end up or who you'll see in Life is Strange 2. So, did the game execute this idea well after Before the Storm hinted at it? Not at all, and the biggest problem with it is right at the beginning. The setup to Sean and Daniel running away is poor, as our motivation for running is completely nonsensical. Let's go over the initial conflict in the game. Daniel, being a goober kid, gets some concoction of zombie blood all over another kid in the neighborhood. 
The kid then goes on a tirade about how the no good Mexican family should just go back to Mexico, and how their family is a bunch of losers and their mom left them, just generally provocative things. You wanna go? Oh yeah, uh, motherfucker? Then go back to your own country. <laughs> Whoa! Sean, you hit him! <sighs> I'm not saying interactions like this don't happen, but it really shows exactly where this game ends up going. More on that later. Anyway, Sean decides that what he said was enough to warrant a physical attack because he's immature. Yeah, go back to daddy. Pussies. No wonder your mom bailed on you. Whoa! Sean, you hit him! Get inside now! Sean! You're dead meat, bitch! <sighs> You and your whole fucking family are going to jail, losers! You'd think that this would change eventually in a series where coming of age is featured strongly, but it doesn't. A police officer sees the fight breaking out, and decides to react to a couple of teenagers fighting in a neighborhood by pulling out his firearm. Maybe the fake blood made him think that they're armed, but why would Sean be punching the kid instead of using the weapon? The cop appears to be very nervous and tells the kids to shut up when they try to clear up the situation. This is not how officers respond to this kind of situation. They're much calmer, but of course, Sean and Daniel get one of the most incompetent cops of all time to respond. This is just the first data point in the pattern. Esteban, the father, runs out and tries to de-escalate the situation. The unreasonably trigger-happy cop then shoots Esteban after he advances towards him, which is definitely poor judgment on Esteban's part, and then a paranormal force trashes the immediate area and much of the neighborhood. The shooting itself looks like a straight-up parody. The cop literally shouts, get on the ground, and shoots Esteban down without giving him any chance to comply. Do I anything. said don't move! Oh, it didn't Daniel, do anything! It's gonna be alright! On the ground! And you'd think that he would back up when Esteban is advancing slowly, considering that he has a ranged weapon that would still be sufficient if any further conflict broke out. Sean then wakes up while Daniel is still unconscious. He realizes that his father and the cop are dead, and decides to quickly pack and make a run for it, and doesn't look back. Not only is the situation with a cop unrealistic beyond those involving the most incompetent officers we've ever seen, but the motivation for running is not convincing at all. In the dashcam footage of a police car, which is the best evidence the police could go off of, all you see is a paranormal force pushing things away from the scene violently after the gunshot. It's not an explosion or anything. The closest thing you can attribute this to, that's somewhat realistic, is an impossibly strong gust of wind. Why then would the police assume that Sean and or Daniel had anything to do with the officer's murder? You could say that they retaliated after the officer shot their father, but with what? Could anyone seriously think that these kids are carrying around C4 packs or pipe bombs with them everywhere they go? Well, Sean sure seemed to think that the situation was incriminating beyond him just beating up the other kid, and so he ran. Turns out, he was right. The police somehow thought that they actually did kill the officer. This could just be a case of Sean committing the mistake of running and thus incriminating himself by doing so. Why would you run if you aren't guilty? Sean easily could have explained the situation away, minus his attack on the neighbor. I'm okay with characters making mistakes and not rendering the ideal outcomes. That's what makes them human and realistic. But this is the entire game being set up by one very stupid mistake. And even if it was a mistake on Sean's part to run, the footage on the camera is still far too inconclusive to blame anyone. It's an unrealistic and therefore novel situation, and I don't understand how anyone looking at the video could possibly think that the kids used a weapon that killed the officer, flipped his car, and leveled the neighborhood. Did they have a suitcase nuke or something? Hey guys! My mom just got me the Nerf nuke! Sean also later suggests that he's running from being separated from Daniel in foster care, but did he not think of a Reynolds at all? Why did you run away if you're innocent? It happened so fast. I saw the cop on the ground, and my dad, and, and I freaked out. Oh, I know. You poor thing. That just made things worse for you and your brother. You know the police would separate us. Maybe forever. Daniel would end up in foster care. You can't be sure, Sean. Even Karen was willing to step up, though it's understandable why he would count her out. 
Whether he's running due to that or the incriminating scene, it's a terrible move on his part. Life is Strange is clearly meant to have paranormal events drive the story, but the problem here is that the entire story is mostly set up and driven by a paranormal cause. In the first game, there were several issues going on beyond just the paranormal. There was a whole date rape murder investigation throughout that could have been told without any supernatural factors. The problems that plagued Arcadia Bay in the background were already going on before Max acquired her power. In the second game, everything was a result of the paranormal. Nothing would happen at all if there was no such paranormal force. Granted, this is also true of the first game when accounting for the deterministic theme, but it wasn't something you'd realize at the very start. I digress. Had there been no supernatural force, Sean and Daniel would have just been taken into custody, explained what happened, been let go, and maybe would have went on to live with the Reynolds or Sean would get an assault charge at most, but nothing even close to the magnitude of the events that followed. No, this turned into a whole fiasco. Why did the police actually suspect the kids of killing the officer? Well, the game never outright says it, but based on the later interactions in the game, it seems to imply something something racial profiling. Tomorrow you're going to Jolina Shore and you'll be arraigned in court for the murder of a Seattle police officer. You might spend the rest of your life in prison, or you can talk to me. I didn't kill anyone. The end. So, who did? You do know. It's just, I can't. Was Daniel involved? Is that why you can't talk? No, no way! And you're absolutely sure your dad didn't go after the officer? Yeah, he came outside, then he was killed. That's what he did. Just guilty of being... Who knows? I hear... The story is already off to a terrible start, and it resulted in a lingering question that was in the back of my mind throughout the whole game. Why are you running? Why are you running? The police never explained their reasoning for suspecting Sean and Daniel of murder initially, though the two ended up just committing a bunch of crimes on the way, so that just made it even worse. The whole situation just feels like it takes a lot of mental gymnastics to make sense of the story's initiation. A quick note on Esteban. He's probably the most likable character in the game, aside from David who I just like because of the other games. Esteban is obviously made to be highly likable so that when he's killed off, you get a sad moment with some sympathy for Sean and Daniel. The problem is that Esteban didn't stick around for nearly long enough to build any investment, so it's hard to care, especially when the ridiculousness of the intro sequence is at the forefront of my thoughts. All Esteban's death did was disappoint me because I wouldn't get to see more about him, as I was more interested in him than the rest. This problem carries on to several characters you'll encounter, because as I said, the setting isn't recurring and thus the characters change throughout. I can't get myself invested in a character if they're just wiped away, never to be seen again in a matter of minutes or maybe an hour or two. The level of relatability to the characters is also lessened by the situations they're in. I'm not just talking about Sean and Daniel being in the mess they're in, I'm also talking about people throughout that are also in highly abnormal situations. Pot farmers in the middle of a forest, a religious cult in a tiny desert town, a little RV village in the middle of a desert, etc. The people you encounter are often not normal. There's always some kind of quirk to them, whether the game shows in a positive or negative light. Hard to believe that they could make characters more quirky than kids that go to an art school, yet here we are. This fervor reduces the level of normalcy in the world. The setting is always changing, unlike in our everyday lives, and the characters are generally oddballs that you wouldn't normally encounter. Maybe it's par for a course when you're running from the cops, but it's still abnormal compared to what we're used to. It moves the game from what Life is Strange was, and closer to other wacky and unrealistic adventures. It's not inherently bad, but it's not Life is Strange as we know it. There's also less room for foreshadowing, like with Jefferson hinting at his plot early on, the doe standing over Rachel's grave, the alternate timeline representing the bigger picture, the second moon going out before Chloe's death, or the nightmare setting you up for the final decision. Moments like these just inherently can't happen as easily with how Life is Strange 2 is set up at least not between episodes or locations, nor with any subtlety. I'll get into some of the wacky side characters later when I talk about the themes, but let's take a look at our main protagonists. Sean is introduced, much like Max, appearing as a bit of a blank slate to build upon. He's unexceptional in either physical or mental ability, he's rather immature like I mentioned before, and he's a teenager. I have two problems with him as opposed to Max. 
For one, he's now the character that lacks development, and not for a thematic reason. He doesn't mature at all, and doesn't really have any noticeable mental development like Max did as she gained responsibility and lost her initial innocence and naivete. Secondly, he doesn't really have a cohesive personality. Max's life was dedicated to art and hipster crap. Sean likes… running, I guess? Skateboarding, skiing, weed, a mild interest in cars, seems like just a hodgepodge of typical teenager activities, and they're irrelevant throughout most of the story. He also likes drawing, which he does do, but his interests never come together to build a true, consistent character. The drawing aspect really doesn't seem like a part befitting of his persona, but more like a tacked-on feature to replace the previous photo collectible. In short, Sean is boring. It really doesn't take a lot to make a teenager with a personality, but I guess Don't Not failed even there. He didn't even need to have a personality that I could connect with, Max certainly didn't, but he doesn't seem to have any real passion or purpose, something to make him seem like a human and not just a shell of one. Maybe he's just like many other teenagers who lack direction in their lives and don't know what they want. Maybe some teenagers and young adults would find him relatable due to that lack of direction. Or maybe it's just fitting due to the lack of known direction in the overall plot. But how many times do we need to hear a story about a teenager who doesn't know what they want? I'd much prefer a story involving someone who has a purpose and is at least trying to get their life together. If nothing else, maybe it could act as a motivator for those who don't. Sean's immaturity is nowhere near that of Daniel's. He's incredibly annoying and lacks any redeeming qualities. In using his power, he's a loose cannon. You can teach him to control himself better, but for the most part he tends to create unnecessarily difficult situations. And in situations where using his power would be beneficial, he can be hesitant. It's like he just can't get it right. His personality is deep. He likes chocolate bars and Minecraft. Seriously, Minecraft? When was this game written? The epic Minecraft dubstep era was dead by the release of the first game. He's 9 or 10 years old, depending on the episode, but acts like he's 5. But he's just a kid, aren't kids naturally going to be annoying? Isn't this just realistic? Sure, to some degree, having a kid be annoying is realistic because they don't know any better, but it can be done more tastefully. Daniel may act like he's 5, but do you know who's actually 5 and infinitely more likable than Daniel? Hugo from A Plague Tale Innocence. If you're looking to write a small child in a video game that the player is meant to watch over and protect, then Hugo is a much better example. Hugo was a heavily sheltered five-year-old with little to no exposure to the outside world. Despite that, he wasn't that annoying. He was just a generally curious kid who wanted to see the world and learn about it. He'd constantly pester Amicia with questions about what's going on or run off to look at something. Oh, what are those birds? Ducks. Oh, like the ones we eat? Yes, and they eat frogs. That's life. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Uh, come on, it's not a good idea to stay here. Is he always like that? He hasn't seen much of the world. This isn't the best moment to start. It was an annoyance, but it was also conducive to his development. He'd also often get frightened and act erratically in a stressful situation, which was realistic for a child stuck in a war-torn, plague-ridden land. Yet he eventually matured, and learned to keep calm in these situations, and even take control of them. That was the extent of his annoying qualities. It was a mix of curiosity and fear, both very realistic qualities for a child. Daniel, on the other hand, is annoying just to be annoying, not because he has some greater motivation like trying to learn something. He's just a troublesome kid who you have to control and protect. It always takes the form of begging for something, disobeying you, pestering you just for fun, or getting cranky and throwing a tantrum when he doesn't get what he wants. It's way beyond a realistic level of annoyance, and it damages the story greatly. As Daniel annoyed me and got into unnecessarily tough situations with his horrible decision making, it was so much and so often that I completely lost any motivation to help him. Sean's role was to protect Daniel, lead him as they escape the US, and help him mature in controlling his power and making good decisions. I get that the game is trying to say that you should overlook the annoyance and still look out for him, but by the end of episode 3, I really didn't care in the slightest to do any of that anymore. The one positive thing I can say about Daniel is that he does actually show character development. Your choices in the various situations you encounter affect his growth and morality. He may or may not end up being a morally good person depending on how you guide him. That's at least something good about him. He's malleable and grows based on your guidance. 
It just really feels like that Grove can't ever be fast enough, because any strides he makes throughout are usually overshadowed by his general disposition to be irritating and spontaneous. The themes of Life is Strange were one of the biggest reasons why I liked the game as much as I did. It gave me a lot to think about, and I generally like when a game leaves me with lots of interesting things to connect when I'm done playing. By contrast, the themes of Life is Strange 2 are my main gripe. This was the biggest flop by far, and I'll start with the high-level philosophical themes in the game. You know, the ones that I could rant about for hours in the first game. Being a Life is Strange game, coming of age is naturally present. It's a bit of a switch up since the character you control is now the one who doesn't experience development. I guess it's just focused on whoever has the power, so Daniel is the one who actually shows some results despite you lacking direct control over him. Coming of age in the previous game was about learning responsibility and corruption of the mind. Here, it's instead focused on managing chaos and general moral decision making. Management of a stressful and chaotic situation is an important aspect of maturity. Staying calm and maintaining the ability to think rationally under stress can be a necessary skill. This is what I think they were going for in showing Daniel gaining control of his power. He initially had the power to vaguely follow his emotions rather than having direct control over it with deliberate thoughts. When he initially had trouble controlling it, it seemed to be representative of what happens when we respond to issues emotionally without thinking. It just creates chaos and makes the problem worse. In learning to control it, he's now using direct thought to shape the response, and his power becomes more detached from his emotions. Okay, this is off to a good start. Rational thinking over emotion is what leads to good decision making in general. Daniel exhibits mastery of his power around the end of episode 2 or the start of episode 3. The message just seems to get muddy after that. Daniel's decision making does not improve. He does learn to control his power better, but he still gets irrationally angry and just ends up abusing his power, potentially creating just as much chaos as before. He gets himself in a terrible situation, it's like leaving the house to play with Chris and tricking him into thinking he's a superhero, getting himself and Sean fired and screwing over everyone out of their pay by going on Meryl's property without his permission, joining Finn in a heist on Meryl which results in the farm's destruction and Cyclops Sean, and then joining a church community while acting like the second coming of Christ. After the last situation, he's never really put into any more positions to make hard decisions anyway, with the exception of what he does in the endings according to his moral standing. So he really doesn't show any gradual growth in this regard. He does regain some more control of his emotions though, more on that later. Additionally, the nature of the power presents a problem in conveying this kind of message. The power's primary use is brute force. So while Daniel gains control over his power and shows an increased ability to stay calm in stressful situations and stay on the task at hand, which peaks during the prison break, his solution to every problem, unfortunately, has to be brute force. Fight chaos with more chaos, and that's the only way he can control the situation. It goes without saying that that answer can't apply to every problem you face, and there's no distinction made here. Daniel never uses his power in any other way when under stress. There are some scenes of him helping with it, like lifting the bookcase that fell on Steven, or helping Joanne with an art project, but these situations aren't as significant as those where he solves problems with brute force. Perhaps they could have thrown in a more stealthy approach to a major event, like the prison break, to show a different way to solve a stressful problem, but that distinction wasn't made. I'm really trying to connect Daniel's power to something meaningful here, but with the result being as inconsistent as it is, it makes me think that the power was merely thrown in to make the strange part of Life is Strange, without nearly as much care story-wise as in the first game. Morality is the second major theme to look at here, and I think it's important that I distinguish why the way it's presented in Life is Strange 2 is different from how Max learned responsibility in the first game. In Life is Strange, Max saw her decisions change the direction of subplots, character interactions, and the world around her. Decisions that she made had direct outcomes that came later. This is how the game showed the importance of good decision making and accountability for your actions. Life is Strange 2, because it has a setting and characters that are constantly changing, doesn't show results in the same way. You'll get this sometimes, but the effects will be seen immediately, rather than shape the world that you continue to exist in. Many choices actually don't have any long-term effects. The main way that the moral decisions show their effects is in how Daniel acts as a result. Is there much of a functional difference between the shaping of your morality and the shaping of your responsibility? 
Not a whole lot, it's mostly semantics. The primary noticeable difference being that the responsibility theme focuses more on showing later outcomes of actions, thus holding you responsible, and the morality theme is more about refining apparent behavior with decisions. But for the sake of distinguishing them and how they're actually worked into the game, I'll be referring to the Life is Strange 2 theme as morality, as opposed to Life is Strange's responsibility. Daniel's behaviors change throughout the game based on how you've told or shown him how to act. It's a view on how a role model can influence people who look up to them. You can therefore shape Daniel to be good, as good as Sean can really make him considering how immature he is, or bad. Daniel learns from Sean's leadership, and you see how he grows based on what you did, and it ultimately partly determines how the story ends. The endings work well with the theme, because the final outcomes are vastly different from one another, and that's when you see the greatest effects of your decisions. However, the theme is ultimately shallow compared to what Life is Strange had to offer. How much can you really discuss here? Do bad stuff become bad? Do good stuff become good? It's really nothing stimulating. Do good. Yeah, we know. I could also include one other theme, brotherhood. Sean and Daniel stick together throughout and learn to set aside their differences in favor of benefiting from each other, as brothers naturally would. You can do things throughout the game to help or hurt their bond. There doesn't seem to be a clear message here because it's rather conflicting. On one hand, Sean and Daniel are able to work through many problems they encounter, albeit not always in the best way, by working as a team. Sean eventually warms up to Daniel toward the end, which may be his only real development, learning to tolerate Daniel's annoyance to work together with him better. On the other hand, Daniel is such a huge liability for Sean that his allegiance to Daniel, held together by them being brothers and therefore inherently feeling an obligation to stick together, becomes questionable. Is it really in Sean's best interest to work with Daniel? I know that the developers probably intended to show you that you should stick to those closest to you no matter what, because it'll work out in the end. But like I said, I lost my motivation to help Daniel entirely because Daniel's annoying qualities and poor decision making skills were taken to such an extreme that I couldn't be arsed to care. No matter how well you try to work with him, he always seems to get himself into trouble. Brotherhood isn't always a good thing. What if your brother was like Eddie's brother? Wanna crash in my place, don't ya? That's why we came all the way- Uncle! 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 I certainly don't think it would be in your best interest to stick around. The reason I'm bringing up this theme is that it seems to bleed through to another theme that may have been done unintentionally. That theme is tribalism, which I'll be getting to shortly. But unfortunately, I think that's about it for Life is Strange 2's philosophical themes. There really isn't a lot going on here, especially compared to the first game. Now let's get on to what Life is Strange 2 seemed to push harder, political themes. Life is Strange had several realistic minor themes that a lot of players were drawn to. To me, they fell under the radar in the presence of the philosophical themes and didn't appear to take any sides. They were merely presented as something to think about, not pushing any sort of agenda. This is where Life is Strange 2 is a polar opposite to the first game. The philosophical themes are lacking, and really pale in comparison to the political themes in terms of their significance. And whereas Life is Strange took neutral stances on whatever issues it brought up, Life is Strange 2 is very clearly pushing an agenda, and that's demonstrable through numerous encounters in the game. The first theme is the destruction of a nuclear family. As the beginning of the game showed, Sean and Daniel were growing up without a mother. You can already draw some parallels to how Chloe's upbringing went in Life is Strange, but there's a distinction to be made here. Chloe lost her father to an unpredictable accident. There was no choice made to separate, and thus I don't think that theme applies. Sean and Daniel's situation is thus more akin to a problem that is a result of poor choices. Karen left the family years ago, apparently because she didn't feel that the family life was right for her, and she had to find herself. I guess all this time I tried to find out what really matters to Which me. Which doesn't involve a husband and two kids. It does to a lot of people, and I totally respect that. Just not to me. I wasn't good at making plans, which is what most of modern life is about, right? School, job, marriage. Asked my mom and dad. They wanted me to follow their rules, their faith. Oh, I tried, but I wanted to find my own way, with no security blanket. Family, religion, social norms. It's just all about security, after all. But it all just looked like a sweet golden jail to me. I tried to escape that. Really just sounds like some failed roundabout way of saying, I got bored and didn't want the responsibility anymore. 
which is a very real and common situation that drives part of the downfall of the institution of marriage. It's unclear, however, what position is taken on Karen's actions, which is okay since I want to hold both games to the same standard. Upon initially meeting his mom, Sean was very resentful, which is completely understandable. However, after a couple of days of staying with Karen in the desert trailer park, Sean completely flips his position and appears much more receptive to her help, even though she wasn't there for them for years. Of course, how receptive Sean is is guided by the player but his relations with her improve regardless of what you do. I suppose if anything, I can give the developers some credit for at least presenting a real problem that continues to hurt younger generations as time goes on, but I don't know whether they were meaning to show resentment or understanding to the type of person who would do what Karen did. Illegal immigration control is the next theme, and it's quite obvious that they decided to take a stance against it in this game. Sean and Daniel are consistently hassled and mistaken for illegal immigrants, which I suppose they would be once they cross over to Mexico where there's a larger-than-life wall initially blocking their path. The way Sean and Daniel react to the presence of a wall is indicative of a position taken. Why would they build this? Well, you know, it's a border, man. Is there a wall like this up north? Nah, not really. So, why did they build one here? I don't know, Daniel. That sucks. This is on top of the various interactions with other characters throughout, which I'll go over soon. Any counter-argument is never entertained, at least not in a fair way. This theme ties into the greater theme of racism. Like I said, Sean and Daniel face racial bias throughout the whole game, and in very extreme ways. Like destruction of a nuclear family, racism is a real issue, but the way the game shows it completely breaks any sense of realism. The racial bias against Sean and Daniel goes to such an extreme that it is not at all representative of a world we actually live in. Does racism happen? Of course it does, but in Life is Strange 2, it happens pretty much everywhere you look, to an absurd degree. Sean and Daniel go through a ridiculous number of cases of severe oppression and prejudice in a very short period of time. Each of these individual cases would be high-profile news, but this is happening to the same people repeatedly at an astonishing rate, thus making it look like a bigger problem than it is in reality. I'll get to some examples, but first I have to tie in another theme, because they tend to go hand in hand. That theme is the general opposition to authority or hierarchy. It's a core component of anarchism, though the game never directly makes that leap. Like racism, this appears in the game as a much more rampant problem than it actually is. Just about any form of authority that Sean and Daniel come across, they oppose it, or at least have sentiments against it. Again, any counterexamples are never presented. All forms of authority in the game are shown in a negative light. Let's go over all the significant encounters in the game, which illustrate my point clearly. As I mentioned in the intro sequence, we have the racist neighborhood kid who tells Sean and Daniel that they should go back to Mexico upon being angered by Daniel, who apparently ruined his clothes. A bit of a strange response, but it's something that could happen. A police officer then comes to de-escalate the situation, but ends up making it worse by having terrible sense and skill in handling his weapon. He ends up killing Esteban, who was very clearly not a threat. Okay, we've seen police make mistakes in real life. This one is definitely quite absurd though, as this guy shot a dad who reacted urgently to him aiming his weapon at his kids. But maybe by some stretch of the imagination, this could still happen. Next, you run into a vigilante gas station owner who knocks out Sean and captures him in his office after assuming he's a shoplifter no matter if it's true or not. What do you mean? We sure just- hope you pay for all that. We don't tolerate shoplifters. Uh, sir, we paid for this, and the map was free. Well, let's go inside. You can show us what you bought. Now let's go. Don't touch me! Don't do it, boy! Let go! Ah! Don't touch my brother! <sighs> he saw Sean on the newspaper, so perhaps he thought that he was doing the right thing. After all, Sean is the reason we need to build that wall. But I know who you are and what you did in Seattle. I saw it in the paper. Maybe I should call ICE to make sure you're a citizen. Fuck you, hillbilly. I'm American. Mm. Watch it, punk. Whatever. You're going to jail for this. Pretty sure the local police will vouch for me over a thug like you. You're the reason we need to build that wall. 
Daniel helps Sean break out, and who comes to a rescue? Why, it's the Amazing Atheist. Or Brody, rather, who is a seemingly liberal guy supported by his rich parents and working as a traveling journalist, currently reporting on nudism. Why did he freak out on us? Good question, my friend. There are a lot of messed up people out there. And you've thrown a little racism. Yeah. I don't think he was down with our last name. Welcome to Redneck Land. A Saint Seattle no more. Yeah. My dad said there are more Bigfoots out here than Mexicans. No doubt. People out here are more scared of you and your little brother. This is nuts. I come from a family with money. But... No soul. I took off after school... and never looked back. Now I write stories for zines and websites, do podcasts, protest, try to make some positive change. Yeah, whatever. Wow. So you're like all... political. Everything's political, he says. I guess in reference to the rest of the game. Later, you run into the Reynolds family, Sean and Daniel's grandparents on their mother's side. They run a highly conservative household, and although they aren't opposed to Sean and Daniel, they are the first figure of authority, other than the police, that they encounter. They have strict rules that are meant to keep Sean and Daniel disciplined and out of sight. You can choose to break these rules if you wish, and you might just see some more racists on the internet. Who are these assholes? That's some fucked up hate speech. Lila seems to be having a hard time. Never seen her this salty. Why do I have to do homework when I'm not even in school? You tidy the mess in our room, and I take care of the laundry. Cool? Yeah, sure. It sucks. I know. Sean and Daniel are thankful for their help, but are often displeased with how restrictive life is at their house, and thus end up rebelling by spending a day with the Erickson family. Sean, come on. You know I haven't done anything fun since I got sick. It's the first time I've been out for days. We won't be gone for long, the market's only a few miles away. At the market, you encounter Finn and Cassidy. They're a couple of nomadic, free-spirited, down-with-the-system types, who Nick promptly tells to frig off. Nick seems to be a libertarian, the American kind, not the socialist kind, and sees people like Finn and Cassidy as a burden on society. Well, the city does. An unleashed dog is liable to a fine, so... Uh, you're gonna fine our dog? Well, that's not very nice. Loitering is illegal, too. And you don't live here, right? Right? Calm down, sweetie. We're allowed to visit the Christmas market. Our dog's not gonna eat you. Look at him! You better watch your mouth. You punks are always causing trouble. This is a nice town, okay? <laughs> Jeez. Someone needs to get laid. <laughs> He's out of pills. That's it. I'm calling the cops. Fucking parasites. Nick is clearly panned as the bad guy, as Sean and Daniel befriend Finn and Cassidy, and optionally mess with Nick. Sorry, getting tired of these parasites, if you know what I mean. Uh, not really. Just tired of lazy people, you know? Just waiting for useless governments to feed them. Hey. You look smart. You should check this out. It's not conspiracy stuff. Huh. Swear. Um... No thanks. Sorry. Why? Don't you care about our country's future? Yeah. In my own way, but... Not like that. I get it. You millennials want everything for free. That's not how we built this country. Like those punks you were with. They're nothing but trouble. You better be careful. Hmm. Thanks. Glad to see some millennials who care about this country. We care. I don't know. I see a lot of whining snowflakes. Nobody wants to work. I don't know. They're not hurting anyone. They live differently. That's all. Plus, your music was really beautiful. It's great to live off your talents, but come on. They're not achieving anything. Hey man, you got a dollar? Is not fighting the power. This is why our country is broken. Deadbeats. You don't know anything about them. You're just judging them. No, I'm judging their actions. They don't deserve this country. Well, it's their country too. Okay, smartass. 
I see where this is going. As usual. Sorry to bug you. Huh. And how do you fix it? By asking that question. And don't let the government ever stop you. Look, it's up to us to make sure our streets are clean. We the people have to take care of the trash, right? I guess. We have to take care of our own kind first. Sean and Daniel are then driven out of town by the police and decide to hop on a train, like Finn and Cassidy mentioned they do. You'll then encounter some more free spirit nomad types when you go work on a pot farm in the middle of a forest, where all of them are temporarily working and living in a commune. Sometimes they share some anarchist views or talk about how they've faced some sort of injustice in the past, involving authority figures and racists, of course. I'm not gonna settle down. No way. That's how shit starts, you know? When you start having things of your own, things you ought to defend, property, land, family. What do you think you're missing out on now? And the game tries to convince you that these people have a healthy lifestyle, just a different one. You make friends with them, and again, you run into an antagonistic figure of authority. Merrill and Big Joe. These guys treat everyone else like crap, and supposedly take an unfair share of the profit for themselves. You even play a terrible minigame to make you feel like a slave. Finn and Daniel eventually decide to go and rebel against another figure of authority, and Sean can optionally join in for this anarchist uprising. Sean, after the conflict, is then found in a hospital, where the police guard his room. Time to run from the cops again, but not before clocking the nurse in the head with a metal bar. Sean steals a car and heads through the desert, away from the hospital and trying to find Daniel. When stopping to sleep, he runs into a couple of guys who apparently own the random patch of sand that he stopped on. I wonder what they did. Well, one of them gave him a hard time for being Mexican and possibly beat his ass. A complete overreaction to finding a kid sleeping in a car. Don't do this. Oh, you don't want to share your language? <laughs> okay, maybe you know this one. Uh... I'm a dirty thief with one eye. <laughs> Soy un ladrón y chinga tu madre. Uh, wait, madre? Uh... What did you really say, asshole? Huh? All I want to do is learn Espanol. <laughs> Might be our official language someday, right? See, si, senor? So, one more lesson. How do you say, this is not my country? Fuck off. This is my country. Hoo-hoo-wee! <laughs> Did you hear that? Look, Chad, it's gonna rain. Let's go before we get soaked. No, we took the country back. Hold on. This little thief is fucking with me. You're really pissing me off, you know that? No. Really? Okay. I warned you, boy. Stop! Stop it, Chad! Uh, what the fuck, man? Uh, 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 holy cow! What are you doing? Listen, you little beaner. Get your shit and go. Now! Sean then drives away, runs out of gas, and then eventually gets to a town with a small church. Turns out, Daniel has been playing Miracle Worker this whole time to a group of fundamentalist Christians, who are now obviously very protective of him because they think he's an angel. They brainwash Daniel, now exploiting him for money, and refuse to treat their sick child while instead relying on faith healing. They even tried conversion therapy on Jacob for being gay. They're clearly the bad guys here. Wanted to cure you from... Being... <sighs> Pretty much. I always showed more interest in boys than girls. <sighs> they thought I was a freak. A sinner. Sean enlists the help of Karen to fight them and get Daniel back. Another big bad conservative authority figure, this time a religious one, taken down. Can you see where all of this is going yet? Karen then takes Sean and Daniel to a trailer park village in the middle of the desert where she stays with other escapists. Among them is an artist, a gay couple including a deadbeat dad, and somewhat surprisingly, David. They seem to be living in a sort of little anarchist community. 
There is no hierarchy, no ruler, and at their small scale, they seem to be quite pleased with what they have. Sean suggests that both he and Daniel had a positive experience, especially Daniel, who supposedly was influenced positively by the people there and regained some of his emotional control. They all help Sean and Daniel get back on their feet for their final escape to Mexico. This final encounter is absolutely egregious and really seems to try to hammer in the point. Sean and Daniel are now at the wall, literally feet away from their ultimate escape. Daniel breaks down the big scary wall and they're about to head into Mexico, only for Daniel to get blasted by a scary assault weapon used by a couple of border patrol vigilantes. Worse, it's even suggested that they're working with some of the local police officers. Did they really approve of their shoot on sight approach? I'm dying to get some choco crisp. It'll be so ah! Hey! Who are you? Did you shoot my brother? Hey, ah! Oh! Bullet just grazed Let me go! Him. Do not move if you want to keep that arm. Comprende? Keep an eye on the wall. These fuckers blew it up so their friends can cross. Daniel! So what's the plan, huh? I bet there's a dozen more coming through, right? No! We're leaving! Going to Mexico, I swear! Wait, wait. You're trying to break into Mexico. <laughs> That's fucking funny. We're Americans! Americans, damn it! Now it's not legal to blow up walls. That's called terrorism. You get it? Do we look like terrorists? We're just kids. Not after you blow a wall up. So tell me the plan. You're not cops. You can't arrest us. No, but we work with them. And they sure appreciate our help. Looks like no one's coming for now. Anyway, don't waste your energy. I bet the Border Patrol has a big plan for you, mister. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> Where's Spencer? He's off duty today. Why? <laughs> Listen, uh, we have a deal. He knows. Yeah, I heard about this crap. Not happening anymore. You're both coming with me to the station. What? Are you kidding? What? They're illegals! A police officer, one who isn't affiliated with the vigilantes, arrives and arrests both parties. Daniel gets his wound treated as Sean sits in a cell adjacent to the assailants. In his cell is a Mexican couple that tried to cross the border, and the mother is pregnant. This really is the peak of absurdity in the game, as Sean and the Mexican couple share a pleasant conversation, and then bicker with the border vigilantes when they tell them, As expected, there are a bunch of racist remarks thrown at Sean and the couple, who share a sympathetic story about how they were just an innocent couple trying to start a new life for their future child. Why do they need to cross so desperately? For the same reasons that everyone, we couldn't support the insecurity or the misery. In Mexico, the violence has many forms. It can't be like that. When my brother was fue... Secuestrado y, y asesinado por una pandilla, nos fuimos. Si hubiésemos pedido quedarnos, nos habríamos quedado en nuestro pueblo, pero queremos darle una vida, una vida mejor a nuestro hijo o hija. Ya no tengo sueños aquí. Sean, has vivido en este país toda tu vida con un padre mexicano. Y ahora los tiempos han cambiado. ¿Cómo crees que va a ser todo en el futuro? No sé, creo que soy un poco pesimista en el camino. No solo me encontré con gente amable. Me imagino. Cuando eres extranjero, tienes que trabajar aún más duro para arreglarte más. Así funciona. Oh, shit. Enough now. It's America. We speak English. We're just talking. No, the problem is you people breaking into my country. We come here to work, not, not steal or live at your, at your home. Diego, no, I am so fucking tired. You only come here to cause trouble. And we have to pay for your welfare. You all want a free ride, and that makes me sick. Immigrants built this country. Where did the founding fathers come from, huh? No, 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 that was different. They made the laws. They wouldn't stand by and let this happen. 
We only want work and, and, and in peace. Yes. An honest job and the ability to raise our child in a safe country. That's all we're looking for. <laughs> That's what you people always say. But the facts speak for themselves. Your facts are just bigotry and hatred. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I hate what you did to my country. Our borders. We have a right to protect our sovereign nation, and we will. Damn right, baby girl. You hunt us like, 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 like animals. I don't think I have a choice. I want the safest country for my children. See? You love your family like us. We don't go walking hundreds of miles in the desert and risking everything for no reason. We do it for our child. A mother must understand. No, you and your unborn parasite have nothing in common with me and my family. <laughs> what? Maddie. What you say? <laughs> oh, see? There you go. Take it easy. This is our country. You win. I would like to get out of here soon. No, you no va a ganar. Dile esto, Carla. Ya, basta. No vale mi Fuck you, you wetback. You and your what girlfriend. What the fuck? Why are we stuck down here with them? You know us. We're helping you, goddammit! This is the most ham-fisted way they've tried to deliver their message in the whole game. These big bad conservatives here literally shot your little brother while playing Border Patrol, and are now being racist to you in jail. You should be angry at them. But look at this poor, innocent Mexican couple to your side. They were just trying to find a better life for their child, you see? And the police arrested them and ruined their hopes and dreams. Don't you feel sorry for them? Here's a question for each side. For the vigilantes, who does this? Has there ever been any documented case of anyone living in a border state literally shooting down Mexicans crossing the border? Did Sean and Daniel just happen to run into the only ones? Well, let's look at some cases of shootings at the US-Mexico border. There's an abundance of articles out there talking about incidents in which border guards shoot illegal immigrants, but that's not what we're talking about here. These are vigilante private citizens guarding the border with deadly force. I was able to find three cases in total that were similar. One case in 2009 involved a nativist militia invading the home of a Mexican-American family and killing them. This happened in a town that's near the Arizona-Mexico border, not the border itself, which is 11 miles away, and the victims already lived in Arizona. I figured it was relevant since the assailants involved had previously patrolled the border, but as far as I can tell, nothing was known to have happened when they did so. The other two cases I could find were in the Vigilante Killings section of a Wikipedia page called Migrant Deaths Along the Mexico-United States Border. The first one talks about migrants being killed in showdowns on the U.S. side of a border. The original article on Time Magazine has since been taken down, but we can still view it via Wayback Machine. This article is about several incidents involving migrants and ranchers. The ranchers here got into conflicts varying greatly in terms of their initial causes. Some started with migrants asking for water, and some started with migrants breaking the ranchers' fences and letting their livestock run free. There are no cases here of U.S. citizens patrolling the border. Instead, the migrants wandered onto their land. The second case was in the year 2000, involving a man who failed to subdue a migrant before shooting him. Notice a key distinction here, attempt to subdue, then shoot, not the other way around. Reading on the case, it looks like a he said, she said situation. The plaintiff's claim was that the migrant was shot from behind after the man followed him, and the defense's claim was that the migrant charged at the man. The one thing there was consensus on was that the conflict started with the migrant coming to the man's property and asking for water. The guy wasn't going out of his way to patrol the border. Oh, and this happened 35 miles from the border anyway, so it's still not that similar. The fact that a documentary was made featuring this single case leads me to believe that these situations are pretty rare. I wasn't able to find one that took place at the border itself, so I don't think these militia patrols are a rampant problem. The chances of Sean and Daniel running into one are slim to none. Now the vigilantes also may not have shot Daniel had he not broken down the wall. But still, it's ridiculous to show private citizens shooting a kid who damaged public property. The crime doesn't warrant sniping the kid, as he isn't endangering any lives, and it's not their job to look after the wall. I highly doubt that border security guards would ever make deals with private citizens to help them, when they're not on the same payroll nor receiving the same training. The fact is, something like this happening would be extremely rare. Why is it that Sean and Daniel just happen to run into the worst of the worst at every turn? It's as if the world around them is rampant with terrible people who don't actually exist in real life, not in the numbers you see. 
I was able to find somewhat similar cases, but nothing like what we saw in the game. I also don't see the point of making a scene like this, when there clearly isn't a general sentiment among Americans that it's okay to shoot illegal immigrants. It's a fringe idea. The vast majority of players gain absolutely nothing from seeing this, and the one crazy border vigilante probably won't be convinced to change their ways. For the Mexican couple, are they supposed to be representative of everyone who crosses the border? I'm sure there are plenty of illegal immigrants who have the same rather innocent goals that they do, but you can't ignore the fact that there are many who cross the border with criminal intentions in mind, such as the drug cartels. Not only that, but illegal immigration can also hurt the immigrants. Illegal immigrants have to trek through a desert for days on end to get to the border, and it's an extremely arduous and tiring journey that would be especially hard for a pregnant woman to make, which the game at least acknowledges, but just for pro-immigrant sympathy. Many would-be immigrants die this way. You only need to look at recent incidents of migrants being hurt trying to cross the border to see the problem with loose border security. The migrants often don't realize how difficult the journey is, or come ill-prepared. Here's an idea. Instead of trying to find ways to let illegal immigrants circumvent the law, or not enforce the law, why not actually propose a change to the law in the legislative branch that would allow these migrants to be legal, and see how that bill would hold up when being voted on by representatives? Sorry for a tangent, I just wanted to bring up some counterarguments that the game wouldn't to try to show a more fair balance. In this scene, they handpicked the very best representatives of illegal immigrants, and the very worst and most unreal representatives of pro-border control conservatives. It's a completely unfair depiction, which they've been building up to this entire time with all the other encounters. And all throughout the game, the police, the ultimate figure of authority, is the main antagonist. You're constantly under the threat of arrest and punishment for a crime you didn't do. Disregarding all the crimes that you did do while running from your unfortunate circumstance, it culminates in a final stand against the police, who you've been rebelling against this whole time. You can succumb to their power or barrel through them. Either way, they're the bad guys. This really is what keeps happening the whole time. All the conservatives you run into are horrible people and racists. All the authority figures you run into are bad and must be rebelled against. All the leftists you run into are good and help you with your journey. And all the free spirits who reject authority are nice to you. There are no notable exceptions to this. It's an established pattern. It's extremely tiresome to see the same left-wing bias over and over again. This is not the world we live in, and thus any message that they were trying to send about a real-world political issue is completely lost because it's being presented in, again, a world we don't live in. It's not just an immersion-breaking bad world, it's a gross misrepresentation of our own world. Racists are absolutely everywhere and always hassling you. Everything is tribalistic, an us-versus-them mentality where you're always pitted against conservatives or authority figures with the help of liberals and people who reject authority. And this isn't just a wacky version of our world made for the purposes of humor and entertainment, like how GTA games can be over the top while being set in realistic places. The absurdity in GTA games is obviously a joke. These scenes are made with serious intent, even if you may be able to laugh at their absurdity. My ultimate question with the racism theme is, who are they arguing against? The vast majority of the Life is Strange audience knows that racism is bad. You don't have to hammer it in by slamming conservatives who you paint as the source of all racism and hatred in your made-up world. And as for the racists playing this game, do the developers think they can convert them? As far as opposition to authority, I'm of the opinion that all authority should be questioned, analyzed for its necessity and validity, but that does not mean that all forms of authority should be dismantled. You have to judge each one individually. Why is every single form of authority presented in the game painted as the enemy? Why isn't there a single counterexample to this? David isn't the same person he was in the first game. Esteban, maybe? Barely. He's just used to set the initial motivation for Sean and Daniel's escape. Let's look at the dynamic at the pot farm. It seems to be a microcosm of the very worst of capitalism. Wage slaves work for a meager pay and under terrible conditions, as the evil businessman and his muscle keep the slaves in check. The slaves want nothing more but to live freely and be able to share and care for each other. Clearly, they're the good guys against the big bad bosses. A few of the slaves then hash up a plan to rebel and steal the farm's profits, which the businessman has been keeping all to himself. By contrast, the trailer park village in the desert is essentially an anarchist society, free from authority. No leaders, everyone works to keep the various systems running for all the people, and everyone shares what they have. 
It appears to work as all the people get along and are happy. Their scale is very small and they still depend on the rest of society to get food and supplies, but never mind that, it's clearly working great, right? Again, I come to a question. Is this game seriously pushing an anarchist agenda and giving terrible examples to justify it as an alternative to the government and economy as we know it? But wait, what about the disclaimer that they show when starting up the game, which says everything in the game is purely fictional? To me, this just seems like a cover-up, which Don't Knock can conveniently point to if they receive criticism on any real or semi-real topic they cover. It's just fiction, nothing more, right? I'm sorry, but when the whole game is set on the west side of the US, in a realistic and modern setting, touching on realistic but misrepresented issues with characters that more or less act like humans, I can see what they're doing. You can't just use the disclaimer as a cop-out. The parallels are there in plain sight. How many players will actually even read the disclaimer that pops up for two seconds at the start? More importantly, how many players may actually get into their heads that the game is representative of real-world issues, even if it isn't? Even if Don't Nod doesn't have manipulative intentions to put forward a political message using this twisted world and fully intend everything to be pure fiction, which I don't think is the case, it's naive of them to look back at what they wrote and think that they can't can't potentially influence players' political views. And even if they don't manage to sway anyone, it can easily, at minimum, act as confirmation bias to people who already hold views that align with the game. The Life is Strange audience includes many young and impressionable people, so we can't just assume that everyone playing will be resilient and know that the game isn't representative of our world. At this point, you may dismiss me as an angry conservative who's just upset at the game showing political takes that I'm opposed to. Partly you'd be correct, of course I'm going to dislike it when I see the opposing view, but that's not the main reason I'm criticizing this. Here's my political compass by the way, I didn't say I liked all conservative views. My gripe here is just how hard it's being pushed, without any nuance whatsoever. It's extreme and unrealistic, without leaving anything up to the player to think about. Life is Strange gave you open ideas to think about in just about every theme. You were given a spark for your own thoughts, nothing more. Life is Strange 2, by contrast, practically tells you what to think. The ideas aren't just presented, they're pushed. A side is taken very strongly and no room is given for discussion. I can come up with my own thoughts about what I've seen, but not within the scope of the game. To argue against it, I'd have to reach in a real life to show why what the game is saying is wrong. If I discuss a theme or message in Life is Strange, I can do it with just the information given to me, or at least mostly. I'm not against a political discussion or message in a game. I just don't want shoved down my throat with absolutely no chance given to the other side. Just dismissing it completely is evil. Even with all that being said, the political messages, no doubt, inherently create division in the fanbase, alienating those who disagree as well as those who value escapism in their games. Don't Nod had to have known this going in, and just banked on the fact that their audience is either already heavily concentrated on one side, or too stupid to notice what they were doing. You didn't have to do this, Don't Nod. You've proven your ability to create a compelling story without taking this route. Life is Strange, save for those who still think it's woke garbage, was not a divisive game, and this time, they've managed to both divide the fanbase and create an otherwise less interesting story. Was it worth it? If this is a sign of them running out of ideas, then unfortunately, Life is Strange will forever be a one-of-a-kind game, and Don't Nod will just be a one-hit wonder. At this point when I was talking about Life is Strange, I went into how the game made me feel. So, how did Life is Strange 2 do? Well, it's seriously lacking. Let's start with the cringe and comedy side of it, a true staple for the series. Sean has basically no potential for any reaction out of me. He's not awkward, he's not funny, he's not anything. He's just a husk. Daniel, on the other hand, is definitely cringy, but his type of cringe seems to be in line with the general approach for it throughout. It's based on content rather than delivery, and thus seems forced. Life is Strange was awkward because of how interactions played out. The subjects that were discussed were usually pretty normal, but here, Daniel's cringe qualities are him being an annoying Minecraft kid who doesn't want to eat anything but chocolate bars. His delivery in conversations isn't really cringy, it's just typical childish behavior. I cringed at what he said, not how he said it. Most of the encounters with other characters in the game end up either being unfunny or without an attempt at humor at all. The cringe and humor of Life is Strange was an integral part of its image, and I'm disappointed to see it go. I found myself rolling my eyes more at the political messages, rather than at how the characters spoke. There are a couple of exceptions, though it's more due to the sheer absurdity of what the writers decide to do, which I can laugh at, 
but it also leaves me disconnected from the game as it contributes to the world's lack of realism. The best example to me here was a scene at the church, where Sean and Jacob Hackerman snuck into the pastor's home to dig up some dirt. Nicholas comes by, so Karen decides to distract him. If you go with her plan, Nicholas seems to respond quite urgently to the distraction. It worked well, I wonder what it was. Well, she burned down a whole ass building. This is the best idea she could come up with? It went up in flames really fast too. Is this her first time committing arson? As with everything else in this game, it's completely absurd, and I burst out laughing seeing it. I also definitely laughed at the absurdity of all the bigots and evil people I encountered. Again, it's the content that's absurd, and it ruins the realism beyond an oddly stated line in a conversation. What of the more serious moments though? The ones meant to tug at your heartstrings? I've already gone at length as to why I don't like nor care for Sean and Daniel, so naturally, this lack of connection makes the more serious moments completely numb to me. Maybe I would feel something if I actually built up any investment whatsoever, but I was behind the fourth wall the entire time. I really don't think much more needs to be said. The absurdity of the situations, the unrealistic characters, the tribalism, etc. All of it amounts to nothing for me. The endings were also disappointing. Some fans might see the endings here as an improvement, as they cater more to your choices in regard to how you shape Daniel. You have a two-way choice, but the outcome is also influenced by how you shape Daniel's morals. This was likely a response to the general player's disappointment in the binary choice in the first game. I can at least commend them for making the endings work well with the morality theme, but ultimately, the endings were less multifaceted than the first game. Life is Strange was stuck in my mind for days after I played it, because there were so many things to unpack. What do you get out of Life is Strange 2? Yippee, I escaped all the racists. Darn, I should have been a better role model for Daniel. It's shallow, and I ended up spending more time thinking about all the different failures of a game than what it gave me to work with at the end. I think that this sets the series in the wrong direction. The writers have proven that they can do better with the first game. So, what do I think an ideal return to form for Life is Strange would look like? Well, I think they should note the qualities of Life is Strange and Before the Storm above all else, and work off that. It doesn't have to be set in the same universe or really share anything content-wise with those games, but the qualities I mentioned would be greatly welcomed. It's not like anyone can even knock that for being unoriginal, just due to how original Life is Strange was. I'd like to see a refocus on realistic worlds, with an established sense of normalcy and high level of relatability, as opposed to a world that wildly exaggerates and sensationalizes realistic concepts. Characters should be cohesive, with good or at least understandable qualities. When conducting a retrospective of Life is Strange 2, Square Enix released a survey, and one question in particular caught my eye. They asked something along the lines of, if you disliked Life is Strange 2, is it because the game wasn't about Max and Chloe? I know many fans of the first were initially disappointed at the lack of their return, and many after playing the game as well. I really hope that they take this criticism the right way though. Players may not necessarily be yearning for Max and Chloe specifically. They want characters like them with the qualities I mentioned. You know why this is evident? Because of Max and Chloe. Players had no prior investment in or knowledge of Max and Chloe when getting into Life is Strange, and now it's a beloved cult classic game. If Life is Strange 2 had Max and Chloe in it, but they were written like Sean and Daniel, it would just ruin Max and Chloe. Max and or Chloe specifically are not paramount to making a successful Life is Strange game. When it comes to including humor, don't try to force it with content. Instead, focus on delivery. It keeps the world feeling mostly natural with some humorous slip-ups rather than making the characters too cartoonish. And finally, make a return to a focus on philosophical themes rather than political ones, as they're highly thought-provoking without as direct of an effect on our everyday lives, and also allow for more escapism. I was intrigued with how Life is Strange showed what fatalism is all about by throwing a wrench in its works with time travel and then squashing free will after it just gave you a taste of it, as well as its darker take on coming of age. And that really surprised me since I initially couldn't take the game seriously at all. My expectations were subverted. Maybe that was the point. I was naive like Max in the beginning, thinking the game wouldn't really go anywhere serious when its world and characters had so many laughable aspects. I got nothing of the sort from Life is Strange 2, and while I don't expect Dontnod to ever make another game as great as Life is Strange, I also wasn't ready for such a flop. Now, the more I look at Life is Strange 2 and Dontnod's more recent games, I can't help but have a thought in the back of my mind that Life is Strange's positive qualities were some kind of freak accidental success. 
How can a studio deliver such a stinker immediately after that? Maybe all the meaning I ascribe to Life is Strange is just a figment, and the writers had just stumbled into it unintentionally. The political messages shown in Life is Strange 2 aren't worth the division they create in the player base, and I don't want to play what feels more like a piece of propaganda than a game. Not only that, but political propaganda about the USA made by a French company. Maybe that was the intent, make it divisive on purpose in order to get people talking about it and giving it attention. Much like the rage bait we see all too often in modern journalism. In that case, I got played. Regardless, I'm not opposed to having a political message in a game. Developers ultimately have the creative freedom to do as they please, and nobody should have the power to stop that. But just as developers are free to make, I am free to criticize. I don't like the heavy-handed political messages they included, or rather engulf the whole game in, and I especially don't think they belong in a Life is Strange game. It's an element that was mixed in that doesn't work with the original formula, and completely changed the resulting game, much like how Enhanced Movement changed Halo. Enhanced Movement isn't always bad, it's just not Halo. Political messages aren't always bad either. They're just not Life is Strange. As of late, Don't Nod Square Enix seem to have parted ways. The same thing happened after the first Life is Strange, so who knows if they'll be involved in making another game. The focus is now on Deck 9 as they're developing true colors. I'm optimistic about this game, yet a bit apprehensive. It appears to take place in a normal setting that won't be changing throughout, while having a localized conflict. I don't think Alex's power has the potential to match the depth of Life is Strange, and I'm not sure any future ideas will. I guess that's what happens when you drop such a bombshell as a debut. Still, it makes much more room for some fun philosophical ideas, and considering that Deck 9 is making it after having proven that they understand how a Life is Strange game should feel with Before the Storm, I'm looking forward to that odd mixture again. The real question, though, is what did they take away from Don't Nod's Life is Strange 2? Did they think Don't Nod made a mistake, or did the right thing? We could see Life is Strange getting whipped back into shape with a proper revival, or just another get woke go broke scenario. Thanks for watching. This was a long video, and although I believe I've been thorough and have done my due diligence, I may have got some things wrong. If you agree and want to expand on any ideas here, or if you have a different take, let me know. If I've made a mistake and need a fact check, let me know of that as well. Otherwise, take care.